So, uh, John, welcome. Thank you. It's good, good to have you back. Yeah. Uh, after last night's talk it's, was it's amazing. It's great to be here. I'm having a blast. Yeah, yeah. Last night's talk was amazing. Brandon, you That's did cool. such a good job with all your questions last night. Yep. It was oh. great. Nah, man. So, um, one thing that actually I wanted to pick up from last night was, uh, and you touched on it briefly last night, but what I think is kind of interesting regarding Spangler is the time period in which he is writing is coming. Um, I mean, there's this profound seri uh, feeling of anxiety in Europe because it's the end of the divine right of the kings. You have the French Revolution. Uh, and, and then right after that, well, right before that, you have the American Revolution. Then you have the French Revolution. Then you have Napoleon spreading, taking those ideas of the French Revolution across all of Europe. And even though he eventually gets conquerors, he spreads those ideas of, of, the, of the Enlightenment and the French Revolution and... And so there's this profound, and then of course you have uh, Germany that, that's um, uh, finally made into, it's, it's unified by, by Bismarck. And so there's this profound feeling of anxiety that's, that's taking place all across Europe as uh, people that were more conservative and uh, it's the end of the divine right of kings and everything is clearly moving towards uh, a war and, and war in a mechanized sense is... It's a big deal. So, uh, I mean, that's sort of a sort of long preamble to get started, but I, I think Spengler coming at it, um, born in 1880 and then dying in 1936 and is primed right there to be really concerned about what's going on in the West. So maybe you could take it away. From yeah, I mean, and the decline of the West is... You're right. It, it's it's a very nervous, anxious book in a sense. It's it's coming out of all this sort of political chaos um, in Germany, um, and there is a sense in which Spengler's, like I was saying last night, kind of a reactionary. Um, but I think that part of the anxiety is uh, a worry that Spengler has about conserving values. Um, he wants to make sure that his vision of the West isn't going to be sort of blown away by the wars. You know, he's worried about that. And part of this vision that he had in that book is to create a sort of museum, you know, uh, in which all of these civilizations have all these unique contributions to make. And he wants to get us to step back from that. And especially with this idea of the, what he calls the Ptolemaic model of history, where we, the West is in the center and everything else is revolving around us. He wants to junk that, get rid of that, and bring in what he calls the Copernican model of history in which each civilization is its own center. Um, in, inside each of those civilizations, it would appear that you would have a Ptolemaic cosmology. The Chinese in particular are famous for this. We don't need anything from anyone. That's been the attitude of China all along. Um, but this is the same with all the civilizations. They all think they're the, at the center of the world, not just the West. And so that's sort of Spengler's point is to see these civilizations, line them up, um, and show what the unique contributions of each of them are and what their values are. And I don't see anything colonialist in that at all. Um, <clears throat> I remember Camille Paglia saying that, <clears throat> you know, if you, the problem with the postmodern deconstruction of these kinds of narratives is that uh, we lose this idea that each, we have these civilizations. Uh, who, I'm a white guy, who am I to speak for India? You know, let, it's got to be a Hindu guy. Uh, who writes a history of Indian philosophy. I, I think that's completely ridiculous. I don't see why that should be the case at all. And I think one of the main reasons why um, Spengler is coming back is because people realize that with the postmodern deconstruction of grand meta narratives, with the accusation that anyone like a Joseph Campbell, anyone, Joseph Campbell, Oswald Spengler, who's encyclopedically learned about all the civilizations is somehow colonializing these other cultures, stealing uh, their ideas, speaking on behalf of them. Well, that has left a kind of a, uh, in the wake of post-modernity, as it has shifted into hyper-modernity, kind of a dark age, a gap there. We've lost touch with the knowledge that we had, let's say, even in the 1960s of, with these other civilizations and uh, Chinese thought, Indian thought, 
So I think Spengler is doing a project that is extremely important. I mean, I know and, that like that sorry, idea is yes. trendy, uh, like that, you know, if you're from country X, you can't talk about, if you're from civilization X, you can't talk about any other civilization. So I know it's trendy and therefore a powerful idea and therefore in that respect, maybe worth discussing. But just on its merits, that to me is like so dumb an idea that it's not even worth, I mean, it's not even worth taking serious. I mean, the idea that like a human being couldn't study another civilization and say interesting things about it and learn interesting, which is again, like kind of how a lot of discourse in the academy is conducted today. Right. But, so, but again, it's like, that's not an interesting, like there's nothing behind that argument, right? I mean, like who, who like do any of you seriously think there's anything to that argument? Well, there's, to? there's one thing I want to add to that before you jump in is <clears throat> that's actually this kind of cross-pollination of ideas and the borrowing from other cultures and this appropriation as they use it, that's actually how culture gets built. Yes, that's so, exactly so right. The idea to kind of Great point, separate, uh, Dorn. separate yeah. everybody into their the little atoms and atomize everything, that postmodern idea is, <clears throat> is extremely destructive. And it kind of um, points to uh, Foucault's like idea to as a as a kind of deconstruction, uh, like striving for Marx, Marxist uh, anarchy, you know, and and we can see that that's what's happening. So like maybe you can just pick up more on that before uh, yeah. I stick uh, my foot in my mouth. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, uh, no. Excellent point about this cross pollination that all the civilizations have done this. Um, as I've studied them, um, it's never the case that it's just one ethnicity, you know, that's creating. A, most of these civilizations are built up anyways. Like uh, we were talking about last night uh, how the West has these two sort of subcultures right. with the Rhine as the border, the Promethean and Epimethean, uh, as Toynbee calls them, that make up the macro civilization of the far Western society, as Toynbee calls it. <clears throat> but all of these civilizations have at least that kind of, uh, and it may be a two-party system, let's say. It may be the thermodynamic uh, engine that drives these civilizations. Egypt, for instance, is made up of two societies as well, Upper Egypt and Lower Egypt. They're both very different. Uh, they're, they're both Egyptian, but they're, you know, they worship different gods. Um, they unite together uh, under Narmer, 3000 BC. He comes up from the south, conquers the north, unites the whole thing together. Ah, now we've got Egypt. Now it's up and running. For a thousand years, and then every now and then you get a breakdown, an interregnum, and once again the split happens and the North and the South go to war during the interregnum until they get conquered, pulled back together again. Now they're off and running for the Middle Kingdom for 500 years and so forth. That, that's, that's the rhythm of that civilization. It's two different worlds there. And almost all the civilizations have at least two different worlds um, as well as multi-ethnicities. In the Sumero-Babylonian civilization, the Mesopotamian civilization, uh, if you just look at the Sumerians alone, uh, they're made up of two ethnicities, the Sumerians who spoke Sumerian and the Akkadians, who are the earliest Semites that we know of, um, they're there from the beginning. Uh, they go back and forth to ethnicities that drive the thermodynamic uh, tension that drives that civilization. Then a war happens when uh, the Akkadian king, Sargon of Akkad, uh, decides to pull a Napoleon, conquers all of it, creates the first universal state, um, and now it's, it's a Semitic empire which, to which the Sumerian peoples now have to be subordinate. And you can see the differences in their art styles. Uh, there's a whole different set of semiotics and a way of conducting business. Uh, the Akkadians were fond, for instance, of nepotism, of putting people in office who are related to you by blood. That was important to them. The Sumerians didn't care about that. They, they had no interest in blood relation uh, as a guarantee of a political office. Uh, that just didn't interest them at all. Also, if you look at uh, Sumerian art, it's all bald-headed guys, clean-shaven. All of their statues, all of their gods are that way. And then uh, with Sargon, we get the long beard with the hair tied back and a bun. And the shaggy beard is a, an Akkadian characteristic, just as it is, let's say, for the Taliban. You, know, you have to have a long, shaggy beard. That's, that's our culture. That's part of our semiotics. Um, and then that disintegrates. Uh, Barbarians come in, external proletariat comes in, destroys Akkad, that gets wiped out. Then the Sumerians make a comeback with the third dynasty of Ur, and there's a restoration that goes on where they start trying to rebuild and reintroduce Sumerian semiotics. Um, they, that only lasts for a century. It, it's, it's backward looking, it's an age of conservation uh, and desperation. 
and they only managed to hold it together for 100 years. And it's a good thing they did do this, though, uh, because otherwise we wouldn't have Sumerian myths and tales. They, they specifically committed the myths and tales to writing at this time so that they wouldn't get lost. Mm -hmm. And they didn't. Uh, so we're fortunate that... that Even that though that have... very act is like a, a, a sign that it's no longer alive, but instead just being yeah. kind of like... It's, uh, they're in yeah, Spangler's yeah. winter stage yeah. at that point. Yeah, oh. Wait, very differently. Just to the side, um, so like, because, <clears throat> because it's interesting, like, so you're saying each of these, first of all, I don't know what to call them now. Like, do you call them cultures? Do you call them civilizations? Yeah, civilizations. I know, right. <laughs> <laughs> civilization is the breakdown. And, and I, like, yeah. what do you, I guess we kind of say civilization anyway, but anyway, like culture, civilization. It's the way we use the word yeah. in the Anglo right. world, right. so we might as well just use Society. it. Society. What, what I was going to say is, um, okay, so it's interesting. So each one has, as you say, there's, there's some kind of division. Um, there are like two forces, um, and there's interplay between them. But there's one idea. Yeah. So yeah, I was yeah. going to ask, um, in general, like, do you think the idea tends to come from one or the other, or is the idea like a synthesis of the two? Well, it's, it's, it, I, I tend to think of it as a synthesis, especially like with Egypt. You have, um, for, for instance, Horus is the god of the south, um, of upper, what's called Upper Egypt, and then Lower Egypt, uh, the primary god there is Osiris. Uh, those two become fused together, and they invent the myth that, oh, well, Horus is the son of Osiris. There, that's a way, we'll create a myth that ties them together that way. So yeah, they, they do have this separate uh, semiotics that get fused together through uh, new myths. Somebody just invents a myth that says, okay, this will make Osiris the parent of Horus. And Horus's brother, uh, Set, um, will we'll make them battling brothers. And Set and Horus are, are Upper Egypt and Lower Egypt, the battling brothers. That's why they're at war with each other. Um, so, yeah, they, there's always a kind of... Well, I mean, what about, like, with infinite space? I mean, could you tell a similar story there of, like, the idea of infinite space somehow being a synthesis of... of of the two like component civilizations of it seems to have come from the north but then we've got the first great gothic cathedrals coming out of france yeah. you know so Actually, i was thinking that yesterday because when i said to you um it's notable right that or, 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 or it's telling that um the germanic peoples have like produced so much of what is of cultural value in the faustian tradition but when i said that i was like the one thing i kept thinking of was like Chartres cathedral and, right yeah so, so that's a good point yeah, yeah so i'm going to jump in and see yeah. if i can add add to that which is um, that those culture forms of the, of the Levant and the Middle East that get laid over the North, the Germanic tribes, are something where, like, if you pull back in time, this, this kind of friction is that the, the North has that independence. They are very individualized. So, like, just before battles and that kind of thing, they're standing in front of a whole army, and they're like, my father has done this, I am the son of so-and-so, and the son of so, and he was the son, and, and we're going to do this to you. And so this, this whole thing of Christianity gets, uh, Judeo-Christianity gets laid as a cultural form, gets laid on top, and they're not looking at it as individuals. You, can, you have to pray in a group. Mm, That's yeah. a much more collectivized thing. And so that collectivized thing get laid, gets laid on top of the individual. It's a, it's a Magian or Magian pseudomorphosis, or is, it, is that um, that's the, but, but what you're suggesting, right? That, in a yeah. sense, yeah. So, you, so you, for a while it dominates. But it only dominates when it's so weak. You know, that Christian thing, as, as Edward, Edward Gibbon would say, kind of helped to undermine the confidence of, yeah. of Rome. Well, actually, and that's what you were talking about last night. So as, as, as Christianity gets into Rome, mm -hmm. and it, even from, from, by the time it gets to 300, it's pretty much over for them. Mm -hmm. and, um, and it's no mistake, you look at like, like 0 AD, there's over a million people in Rome. 600 uh, it's like AD. A few thousand. Or it's like 30,000. Yeah. Depopulation. That's huge. Another depopulation. one of Spangler's main points. So, so yeah. before, because John, John I, you should just respond to all this. I just want to throw in one more thing and then respond to any of yeah. it. Like, yeah. um, uh, you're probably, you know, like Jung's 1936 essay called Wotan? Yeah. Yeah, he, yeah. Well, it's because he, I don't know if you and I have talked about this, but he, he basically argues that, like, if you really want to explain the rise of national socialism in Germany, um, the best way to think about it is that it's like an eruption of Germanic paganism. Um, and he talks in that context about how Christianity is just this thin veneer. It's kind of an overlay from a yeah. different civilization. A pseudomorphism. Yeah. yeah. But anyway, yeah. So, I think we have had, uh, our civilization has had uh, a dual pseudomorphosis. We have two parents, um, 
before I discuss that, let me let me backtrack a bit to look at the Magian civilization, the, the uh, Jewish part of it, as it's coming into being with its two parents, Moses and Abraham. So that civilization has kind of a dual pseudomorphosis from Egypt on the one hand, which is personified by Moses, and from Abraham on the other, which uh, is he comes from the city of Ur in Sumer. He is a Sumerian. That is what he is. Um, <clears throat> and he migrates from Ur uh, down to Egypt and comes back and finally settles in the Middle East. So those are the two parents of the Jewish civilization as it's getting up and running. That's their pseudomorphosis that they have to work with. You know, they pick up things from the Egyptians like circumcision. Uh, they keep that. Um, Moses keeps all kinds of connections to the Egyptian world. Um, eventually, they, they invent the alphabet and alphabetic writing. As, and you can see them doing this, but they take um, Egyptian hieroglyphs and turn them around and uh, um, do things with them to create an aniconic alphabet. The first aniconic script in the world where it's not based on pictographic images now, it's based on uh, sounds, on phonetic sounds. Uh, and it's aniconic right from the start, just as later Islam will be totally aniconic as well. Um, so already that aniconism that's characteristic of um, that civilization is up and running there, just with the creation of the alphabet. So you have a dual pseudomorphosis there that they have to get rid of. Uh, then another one that comes with the Greco-Roman pseudomorphosis on top of the, the, the early Christians. Uh, they have to, it's almost like they're, the, the pressure is such they have to bury their dead in the catacombs underneath the city. Uh, and that's where Christian art begins, by the way. And it's bad art. <laughs> it's not good. But you have to think about the conditions of these artists going into these caves. It, it probably stank pretty bad. There's no light whatsoever but this tiny little candle that you've got, and you hope it doesn't go out. Uh, if it does, you're in big trouble. And you, so you, you can imagine, they want to get in, do the painting, and get out as quickly as possible. So the art isn't very good at first. Uh, so it has to emerge from the cave. The, the, the world is cavern. The Magian world is cavern. The cave, uh, the dead are buried in caves. Um, so they have to come out of that. And as they emerge out of that, the cavern is the true cosmology of that civilization. They have to go through three. They have to shed three pseudomorphic influences from Egypt, uh, Sumer, and the Greco-Roman. They have to get rid of all of them. And Islam is really the first you know, breakthrough to come out where it's beholden to nobody. This is just our unique thing now. And let's go. Well, let's conquer all of it. And the West, I think, likewise has had a dual pseudomorphosis from, on the one hand, um, the Greco-Roman world, and on the other, the Magian world. Right. We've got right. our days of the week are named after pagan gods. You know? <laughs> but Sundays, we're in church, uh, and the whole calendar is calibrated to, you know, Christ as the sun god. Uh, uh, so, in the true, like you're saying with Jung's essay about Wotan, that the, the true, uh, real essence of the West does, it, it, it is Germanic. Underneath that, that double pseudomorphosis um, that's inauthentic is the, the Germanic and also Celtic uh, gods. Uh, those are our native gods. And um, well, it's funny it's, because in the academy, the way it's the, the way discussions of the West are often framed is: Are we more Greco-Roman or more Judeo-Christian? Neither. <laughs> right, exactly. Like, yeah, actually, like, there's a book called Inventing the Individual that I read a few years ago. Um, here, let's put just not, if you don't mind, just put. Um, yeah, and, and the, the, the opening conceit of the book is, like, are we more Greco-Roman or are we more Judeo-Christian? And he argues, like, Larry Seedentop argues that we're more Judeo-Christian. But in any case, yeah, like, Spingler, I guess, was the guy who kind of opened, opened my mind to the possibility that it's, right, that it's neither. Yep. That both are Absolutely. overlays. And, mm -hmm. Right. That we're not, that we're not even a synthesis. This was Joseph Campbell's point, too. Uh, this is how he applied Spengler uh, to his discussion of these culture forms. Um, the, the true myth is the myth of the individual. The myth of the individual who goes into the forest, which is uh, the grail quest, which is the authentic uh, myth of our civilization. Campbell felt is the grail quest because it's the myth that um, you as an individual are kind of on your own on your quest. You find that grail by yourself. These knights go off, each one by themselves, to find the grail. And uh, when it is found, it's just one guy who finds it. The, the, the marvelous castle in which the, 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 the rites are performed and it's totally alien, you know, it's, it's a Germanic idea. You, you know, the Germans invented the idea of individuality through separating the pronoun the, from the verb. Um, they're the first to do this, um, separating the word I from the deed done. There's a separation there, whereas in Latin, let's say, you would say cogito ergo sum, 
but you translate that and you pull out the pronouns. I think, therefore, I am. So there's a difference there. And the Germans were the first to do the, the, the uh, Franz Borkenau, who's a kind of Spenglerian scholar, was the first to point this out, that the earliest occurrence of that separation comes from a German crescent horn uh, thing that, was, that comes from the north, somewhere in Norway, dating back to about, um, <clears throat> oh, let's say 400 AD. And there's an inscription on the horn that says, I, for Gelmer, made this horn. And that's as far back as we can track the separation. But already they're thinking, it's the very act of separating the pronoun from the verb, you're already thinking about me, me. I did this. Yeah. This is me. I'm not part of a group. Yeah, they and, did this. and it's not I that did. something else is being channeled through me. Yeah, right, exactly. Right. right. Wait, sorry, I know I'm talking a lot, but just on this subject, because individualism, I guess like there are two key aspects of it, and as I see it, like um, what one part of individualism is like it, it's important for the individual to be uh, t to be free to act as he sees fit without external compulsion. That's kind of like the Anglo-American notion of liberty. But another very important aspect of uh, individualism is more just like the importance of individual agency and individual heroism and individual action. And it's, I, the reason I'm bringing this up is that I think that, again, like the Anglo-American tradition, at least today, is considered, or, or um, the, the first notion of freedom, just as the freedom should be protected, the, 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 the freedom of the individual should be protected from like state interference, et cetera, or the interfer interference of others. That's actually, I think, more associated with like Britain and the United States than it is with continental Europe. In fact, like, you know, for much of the 20th century, continental Europe, and especially Germany, was considered more collectivistic, right? And like, look at the Nazis, for example. Yeah. Um, but again, like, I think you're talking about individualism in the other sense, just like kind of individual agency, individual action, not so much protection of individual freedoms, but more just like the idea of the heroic individual. Yeah. And that you would locate more in like the Germanic tradition. Yes, I think so. In, in contrast to the Magian, which is the idea that the spirit came down and united us all together as a group with a consensus. You have to have uh, a consensus for each of these little groups, these little pockets of whether it's a group of Christians or a group of Monarchians or a group of Gnostics. They're all bound together by consensus. We all believe the same thing in this group and that collective belief unites this group as opposed to this idea of individuality, of the individual going to find his own grail. Um, so those are two totally separate cosmologies, two totally separate mythologies, uh, totally separate. Mm -hmm. Do you want to weigh in? That contrasts a little bit, God, there are two things I want to get on, but that contrasts a little bit with my understanding of, of Athens and what they're doing there and, and the concept of individual, individuality there and how they um, will write on the back of their pottery. Uh, I am so-and-so, I did this, yeah. and I'll bet that Euphronius could not match what I have done. Yeah. So, and, and then there's so... It's a Greek uh, competitiveness. <laughs> sure. Well, it's, <laughs> I it's, did a better job on this than that idiot. Absolutely. Well, it's, it's that, that idea of trade and, and, you know, the early form of, of trade and capitalism and these things like um, that you, you benefit from your excellence and your merit is depending on, on, dependent on your skill and, and the artwork and that kind of thing is pulling people to, um, as individuals to lift up and see a, a, an artwork that inspires them to be better people. When they make the, the columns, it's, it's so individualized that they know that uh, who did the fluting on the fourth column uh, so all that, the, the concept of the I and the, in the, in the, uh, sorry, and the individual as I know it is instantiated first in Greco-Roman. So I think that's why oh, we, get this, we get this notion of that the individual is important. Um, Absolutely, the individual is important. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. that's actually... Wait, but then what's the difference? Like, what's the key difference? Well, that's... That, and but, but, but between the Greco-Roman individuality and the Faustian, just so I'm clear. Like, I don't... Well, Spangler says the difference is that... Um, uh, the individual in the Greco-Roman civilization, like if, if you look at uh, poetry, let's say Sappho or um, individual poems, they're, they're always addressed to a you. There's no such thing as a monologue, the, like a Hamlet type Shakespeare monologue. Uh, they're always addressing someone else, or, whether it's a competition or an address. It, it's, it's, yeah, it's the West. The, the individual's up and running, but there is still 
this emphasis on an audience. There's somebody else in dialogue with it's me. It's more interior. I'm not just lost uh. like Hamlet is in his, you know, I could count myself a king in a nutshell of infinite space, you know, that kind of thing. Um, but it is interesting to do an archaeology of individuality because the Egyptians really invented the autobiography, for instance. So they already had kind of an inkling of it through tomb inscriptions. Um, when you look at the, the nobles, um, they start in the fourth dynasty uh, making these tomb inscriptions where they want all the merits of all their deeds listed on the tomb. I did this for the pharaoh. I did that for the pharaoh. I was loyal to the pharaoh um, because they're thinking about the judgment of the dead on the other side. When they get to the other side, they know uh, their heart is going to be weighed against the feather of truth of the goddess Mat. Uh, and if their heart w outweighs truth, impersonal cosmic truth, um, they're in trouble. They're going to get gobbled up by a beast called the Swallower. So they want to make sure that uh, they lived in accordance with Mat, M-A-A-T, truth, and that the feather weighs heavier. So they're very anxious about making sure the goddess Mat knows all their deeds. And those tomb inscriptions, though, as time goes by, get larger, longer, and more and more arrogant. Uh, and, and finally, um, in the, intermediate, the first intermediate period, uh, their, their egos are just out of control um, with describing all their great deeds. And they're starting to compete. You know, the nobles are c competing with each other. Well, I did more great deeds than he did. Um, so they're already sort of on the way to discovering the individual. But as Thomas Mann said in um, an address that he gave, where he's talking about this concept of the, the early ego. The thing about it is um, the ego in these earlier civilizations is sort of more open from behind to archetypal energies coming through that uh. ego. And he says, take, for instance, Cleopatra, um, whether it's true or not. But he says she stings herself with a snake um, because that's the myth of the, the serpent and the goddess. And so she's plugging herself into that myth. Even in the act of her death, it has to play out a myth. So everything they're doing is still playing out myths. Um, so the ego is still, it hasn't fully solidified. But I think with the Pharaoh Akhenaten at the tail end of Egyptian civilization, when they're in their winter phase, and we get the phenomenon of Akhenaten, 1350 BC, he comes along with this uh, cult that eliminates all the funerary deities, worships only the sun, um, you can already see the ego beginning to solidify. The, the funerary deities are the transpersonal forces that are render the ego a transparent and open from behind, like Tomas Mann is saying, uh, and Ignaten is already trying to stabilize the ego, and we're getting ready for, uh, Franz Borkenau says, Moses and Homer, who will leave the cults of the dead behind, and once this gradual process that the West has had of cutting itself free from the cults of the dead, beholden to the ancestors, um, that never happened in Asia, for instance, with the Chinese retaining filial piety, uh, respect for your elders, your parents is the number one most important thing. In the West, we left that behind with this process from McNaughton, mm -hmm. Moses and Homer, then eventually the Grail myths. Um, it's been a gradual process of solidifying the ego. Mm -hmm. hmm. Hmm. That's all super interesting. Thanks. Yeah. Um, I'm thinking that <clears throat> to get back to Spengler and um, how he's basing a lot of how he's roping this whole idea together on, on Nietzsche's Dionysian and Apollonian and, and Schopenhauer's concept of, of the will, but also what's going on at that time period, like where I started with the German idealists and, and how there's sort of this play between Kant asking of, of uh, what would the mind be like? so that nature appears to us in the way that it does and say Schilling almost flipping it and saying what would nature be like so that it gives rise to consciousness and that consciousness might be an emergent feature of of nature um, said in another way uh, we are a way of the universe to know itself and uh, I, I, I think these... Wait, one second on that. I'm yeah. guessing you don't believe that, right? You probably don't believe that consciousness is epiphenomenal, that, uh, that it is like metaphysically secondary to nature, or do you? Because that's, that's a big debate. I mean, we've talked about it a little bit. It depends. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, 
Because scientific materialists famously say <clears> yes, <throat> right? You have you have matter and it's oh well. If you're saying them. yeah, that consciousness is just uh, an epiphenomenon, an epiphenomenon of, of, of the physical world, right? Yeah. No, no. I yeah, don't. So you don't. Okay. Well, but what yeah. they're doing too, like with, with Goethe, is is there's a different wisdom in in science and what Kant is doing and what the Germans are doing is is saying. Um, uh, and what I like with, with Spangler, they're they're looking at civilization, not as uh, as this Ptolemaic view and this kind of Darwinian kind of this happened, then this happened, then this happened, and this happened, and and then at the end you have this you know grand thing with civilization and us on the top having done it and like yay for that. But they're what's so fascinating, and this took me a, a long time to sort of get because I'm so used to that concept of history, is. Uh, that it's an organism that, like a human being, it goes through through stages. And and I, um, Gebser does this thing too with his like structures of consciousness. Um, and you can feel that that they're working. These Germans are working this thing out. That there's a dis, a different wisdom, as you might say, that that um, allows trees to grow out of the ground. That's so. Why don't you just pick it up before. Anything. Yeah, I mean, that's Go Goethe's whole worldview was that idea that nature is alive. And not only is it alive, but it contains ideas buried inside each thing, like his model of the, the Erpflanza, the ideal plant, that every plant is a transformation of the Ur idea of leaf. It's like there's an idea in there that's inherent in nature, in what it's trying to do. It's not just random, you know, atoms knocking up against each other. How can you get that kind of organization uh, in a purely atomistic model with, you know, atoms knocking up against each other. What, what are the odds it's going to form uh, forms that are this beautiful, elegant, and intelligent? And it's funny, too, um, <clears throat> when you look at evolution, <clears throat> um, there really, there are transitional forms, but not really. In a certain sense, um, you, you get these early uh, sort of fish creatures that are growing lobe-finned. Uh, they're, they're starting to use their lungs uh, they're coming up for a breath of oxygen and going back down. Uh, the the lobe fins get longer, but then there's a generation where all of a sudden we get the first amphibians now that are crawling, um, and it's like, how do you get from that to this without thinking it out somehow? There has to be an idea. Uh, these eggs that are going to hatch are going to have not lobe fins, but legs, mm -hmm. you know, because mm -hmm. you can't... Uh, Evolutionarily speaking, for fitness, you can sort of combine Darwin uh, with Goethe in this sense. Uh, you can't have a thing that's this experimental mess with legs that don't work. You know, well, let's try it again. It doesn't work that way. The, the evolution knows that uh, if these animals are going to be fit to compete with each other, th then they have to be fit. You know, so it's it's already like there's there's a jump there, there's a leap, and they're thinking it out. So something's going on behind the scenes here that. I don't think that a purely materialistic model could ever account for. So, so what I think is kind of interesting about that is um, uh, that what they're doing is this modern sense that I think um, maybe Heidegger is talking about, but I think Schopen Schopenhauer, that there's this, um, to become an artist, maybe that's a good way of, of, of thinking about it, that the, um, people would say that I haven't chosen to be an artist. This, it's this thing that's working itself through me and needs to make itself out into the world. That's a very common thing that we've heard about, like a lot of people say. Well, yeah, and, yeah I lived in Mexico for a year when I was 20, and it was the first time I, had, I heard a guitar player was saying, you know, it's like something just gets channeled through me. And I'd actually right. never heard anyone speak in that way. And, but, but it's actually a very common way of like viewing what humans do. It's just that in our culture, it's like, it's not so Well, common. the Romans had that, yeah. that concept too of genius. Yeah. You genius. know? So. Well, I mean, sing in me muse. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Like, I mean, that's how, that's how the Aeneid begins, right? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, so that's an interesting thing that I, I kind of want to, to maybe take that and then shift it over towards what you're doing, like in art of the metaphysics, um, art after metaphysics. And in particular, where I've heard you say that you're the champion of metaphysics. And, and so maybe before I jump on that, um, well, no, maybe I'll just say it. There's, there's something that, that Schopenhauer is, is looking at and then later Heidegger. They're, they're creating these, these two senses of, of aesthetics. Um, 
Maybe you want to jump on that before I, it's better to hear you talk than have and, me and kind of. B before you do, just, uh, I'm curious, because um, cause metaphysics is still a discipline in philosophy departments and in the United States, right? Um, but I think like probably, maybe I'm wrong here, but one, one pretty influential metaphysical view is physicalism which is basically just the view that there's no distinction between science and metaphysics. Right. But you would radically reject that, I assume. Absolutely. Okay, yeah. yeah. I, I so think there's a big distinction. So I'm kind of curious, I guess, just to the, before, before we get it, or, I mean, you can talk about whatever you want, but I'm curious, uh, I mean, this came up uh, in the event last night too, but what exactly you think metaphysics is? Um, because I think, you know, it's, it's very hard for, like, contemporary people in the West to think of ultimate re or like base reality as being anything other than what uh, what the, f the physicists tell us it is, mm -hmm. right? I mean, yeah. like that notion is, we kind of think it's woo, you know, to, yeah. to, to suggest sure. anything else. Uh, when I think of that question, what is metaphysics, I, I think of it as first an insight that there's a hidden invisible dimension behind all of this that uh, the human neocortex is uniquely designed to intuit. Animals aren't aware of it, they don't care. Um, but we can intuit it that there's something else behind all of this. It isn't just matter. Um, and another dimension to this is, of course, ideas. And this is where the German idealists come in uh, with Goethe's idea about the leaf as an idea that's incarnate in all plants and trees. Um, there are ideas in nature, and the intuition of ideas is another metaphysical dimension. And none of this has to do with materialism or physicalism because the idea precedes the reality in metaphysics. The idea comes first. The metaphysical dimension comes first. The spiritual dimension comes first. The physical world is a concretion from out of a spiritual world. That's what I think of when I think of metaphysics. So I want to jump in on that too. And, and I think what we're doing with philosophy, and Deleuze sort of talks about that in, in his What is Philosophy book, um, is that the history of philosophy is, is in relationship to that feeling and it's creating a sense of dualism like, like um, mm -hmm. Plato's cave right? or, or realm, the realm of the forms. And it's asking the question, uh, how should people live? How should we live life? What, and, and it's always in reference to this, this absolute, this thing out there that references like this world of the forms that's that has perfect triangles, that has a perfect thing, and, and that this is kind of the world of illusion, you know? And, and many cultures, many religions are doing that kind of thing. The GM. Um, right, yeah. right, and, and Buddhism as well, you know? Mm -hmm. So this, Buddhism really takes it further and just, and, but Buddhism, like, is the way I see it, and tell me, like, um, uh, the way I see it is that these river valley civilizations are kind of cross-pollinating, like, ideas. And so you have this thing with trade and, and, and what we were saying about last night, that you have this step that kind of like people can cross over and they can trade. It's easier to trade horizontally than it is to trade vertically. So a lot of these ideas are kind of cross-pollinating with each other. And so you see the influence of these things happening. Um, Wait, but how, how in your view does what you just said about metaphysics, um, that is... Okay, so, so metaphysics is, is the notion that there's a hidden reality that human beings are uniquely designed to intuit, that other animals can't. Um, and are ideals about how humans should behave part of that hidden reality? Or like, how do you connect just that basic ethical question, how should I act? Maybe ethics isn't even the right term, but just the basic question, how do I act with metaphysics? No, is ethics it all part is of the, the right term. Thing? Because it's yeah. all, you have, to develop, you have to develop your sense of uh, from metaphysics, your sense of ontology, like what is being. For some, the, the reason I hesitate to use the word ethics is simply that it sort of makes it just more boring and less inspiring. You're, you're hanging the, the, the yeah. you're hanging the the whole philosophy has to hang on something. Yeah, you right. know, and and so like it's got to be as rock solid as the sun. It's got to be dependable. You can't be changing and shifting that thing. Yeah, but I guess the so question the is, ethics so is built and laid on top of that. And was the, is 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 the hidden reality at least part partly ethical? Well, for me it is because I believe in karma and reincarnation where in, in that case the ethics just sort of works itself out as you go along. Um, mm. If you're talking about social ethics and how you behave in a particular society, every society has a different system of ethics. You know, the Hindus have the caste system. Dharma, you have to behave in accordance with Dharma. Just as in Egypt you have to behave in accordance with Mat. Um, and they curse 
uh, Ignatin, for instance, because later, after the failure of his experiment at Amarna, which lasted 13 years, where he went and set up uh, the world's first utopian colony, that lasts for 13 years. Um, scholars suspect there may have been a plague that wiped everyone out. Uh, the Egyptians went in there, destroyed, dismantled the city, and they wiped clean from all their historical records any reference to Akhenaten. And he's the only pharaoh that they did that with because, uh, and the Egyptians kept, they were great at keeping records. They had a, an intensely, as Spengler says, an intensely historical consciousness. We know India. every pharaoh, every date, mm -hmm. uh, you know, they kept everything. The opposite of India, let's say, for right. instance, where in India forgot everything. Right. Nobody knows. When was the Mahabharata written? Somewhere between 400 BC and 400 AD. <laughs> <laughs> There's a span in there. Whereas we know Homer wrote the Iliad 750 BC. It's, we can nail it down right about the time of the first Olympics. Um, yeah, so, but with Ignatan, uh, you know, they strike him from the records because he has sinned against Mott in departing from Egypt's traditional gods, all the traditional. The whole point of Egyptian civilization, the thing it did better than anyone, is burial rites, practices, the afterlife. They lived for the afterlife. That's their whole thing. How dare you cut that away from us? How dare you take away our funerary deities? This is what we do. We're Egyptians. And so Akhenaten became the anathema. You don't mention his name. We don't refer to him. Uh, we're lucky we even know about him at all. Um, so that's an, an, an Egyptian ethic where... Mm. Um, this guy sinned against Mott, so therefore he's stricken from the records. So, um, so going but back, civilization has different right. ethical systems but, 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 and but how but you it, behave. But it's based on their, their fundamental <laughs> metaphysical idea, right? It, yeah. uh, very often, yeah. yeah it has, the, the caste system is, well, you were born an outcast because you had shitty karma. You know, that, yeah, so they right. c connect the, the metaphysics to your situation, how you behave, what you do. Yeah, absolutely. But, but I, I kind of derailed us a little bit because um, because you mentioned the is, wait is the title art after metaphysics? That's his book. Yeah, right. I think you were going to get into that, and I'm very curious. Well, no, I'm just sort of setting up the ground. That metaphysics think... was a reference to Heidegger, though. That's Heidegger's metaphysics, okay. where Heidegger defines this historical epoch that he calls the metaphysical age, which begins from Plato and goes down to Nietzsche, basically. Mm -hmm. That's the metaphysical age that Heidegger announces the end of in his works. We're done with that. It's over. Classical, grand metaphysics right. is, is, is a done deal. Heidegger is sort of the janitor who comes in with the broom and sweeps up all the, the pieces, does the best he can with it. But he's philosophizing after metaphysics. And, he, and, and he's so, saying we're going to start from human subjectivity. Is that correct? Like we're going to start from... Like the phenomenal. Well, world we're going to put the subject back into the world. Uh, uh, uh -huh. that, that's the key thing. Mm -hmm. Dasein means s not just a transcendental Kantian subject that are like these, you know, in German philosophy, like with Leibniz or uh, Kant, the, the, the subject is like a monad just sort of floating around, you know, on its own. Heidegger captures that monad and embeds it into a particular time, a particular place. Dasein means self plus world. Um, and so he's embedding the figure back into the ground. Um, so subjectivity, yes, but it, it, it has to be worlded, as he would put it, right. embedded in a world. Uh, you're part of a world. And this is his whole critique against science is that uh, science deworlds subjects. It deworlds objects by laying a Cartesian grid, an XYZ axis, you know, latitude and longitude. Um, everything has to conform to this uh, pre-objective notion of objectivity in which objects are subject to scientific analysis. They're put into what he calls Vorhandenheit mode, which is the mode of self-sufficient entities, i.e. deworlded entities. Whereas Heidegger is like, no, if science were to look at this vase on this table, we could look at it in terms of volume, we could look at it in terms of shape, in terms of geometry, all these objective things that deworld that jug. What I'm interested, what I want to do is, what is, used to, does, perform a ritual lustration, that jug? Is it something that's been part of my family for generations? Now you're worlding it. You're putting it back into a world, right. back into a narrative where it belongs. And so the threat, for, as far as Heidegger was concerned, the threat that science poses is nihilism. You wind up deworlding these objects, deworlding human beings from their worlds. You wind up with a valueless, unethical, valueless cosmology in which ethics, values, tradition don't matter. 
The only thing that matters is that XYZ grid. Uh, and that was, in a nutshell, that's Heidegger's objection to science. And that's his, his aesthetics. Then his aesthetics are built, over, built off that as well, so that the work of art that's created is created for the culture. And it's, it's related to their, their concept of being and, and, and um, what they believe being really is. So that you can look at a pair of sneakers, it says something about, or a pair of shoes, it says something about the culture that you live in. They're not just things that, they're not just random things put together. You look at a piece of artwork, it's like, well, what made people, uh, everything about that work says something about the culture that it was made in. Is that, that's, that's exactly it's, it's right. inside a world. Yeah, he's talking right? about Van Gogh's painting of shoe, a pair of shoes. So, and, and so, um, the problem I have in a sense with, with the, what's going on with the deconstruction of that is what we see in relationship to art and how that comes where it breaks down the conversation. Art is not today, it's not to feed the culture. The only thing that feeds our culture today that our culture responds to is graphic novels and cinema, uh, but that the world of the high arts that always previously had always served people and inspired them or lifted them up and, or it was tied to um, metaphysics and how you should act. Yeah, it's now, and meaning. Right, yeah. now it's more like, how might you act? Well, maybe I just feel like shooting him in the head. Because for what reason? You know, but mm -hmm. if you have something larger than yourself in which you're part of, you're built into, and your, your ethics are built off that, the whole philosophy is built, then you should act in accordance with something. Mm -hmm. Does that yeah, sound about? Yeah. Okay. That's why I like the karma paradigm, because it, uh, it's, it's a built-in metaphysics, if you, and it makes you think twice about your actions, because uh, the basic idea is the, the law of karmic balancing. It's not a punishment, but um, if the soul experiences one thing, let's say, I want to be cruel to this guy. Maybe I want to torture him to death. Um, that's fine, go ahead and do it, but the odds are, next time around, you're going to be tortured to death. Just for the principle of karmic balancing. Uh, so the universe takes care of itself, takes care of its own. So that puts a thought into your head about, hold on a second, there are consequences for what I'm about to do. Maybe I better not do it, because right. there are, I'm embedded in a larger cosmic order that I'm participating in with other beings other stuff is going on, and uh, there's a kind of built-in ethic there of kindness is the best course. Kindness, love, compassion, uh, let's increase that. Let's get that vibration going. Um, so that's why I prefer that paradigm. Mm -hmm. Wait, so Dorian, how do, so how does what we were saying earlier about, um, or how, what you were saying earlier about art, how does it connect to John's arguments and uh, art after metaphysics, which I have not read? I mean, I'm, like, did, did, you like the, did you like the book? Did you agree with it? Like, what are your thoughts on no, it? No, he hated it. <laughs> <laughs> so, no, it's not that. It just You've seems... been lying to me the whole time. Girl. No, uh, no so you did like it. Yeah. No, there, there are, um, there's a little bit of a pushback. There's some of the, the things that I feel that you champion. It, it appears as though you're championing, say, somebody like, like Rothko or somebody like uh, Jackson Pollock or, um, can you remember the guy now that, that does the fat, you know? Um, boys. Boys. Um, and... And the, these things, to me, to my eye, uh, it, it appears as though you're, you're championing those as, as great works of art. I feel like they fit into what you're doing with, with hypermodernity, um, even though like, it kind of overlaps. It's like it overlaps the postmodern and the modern and even Picasso. Like all that stuff is kind of, for me, it's kind of like clustering. They're all building off each other. It's all moving more and more toward just random chaos. And so... As a champion of metaphysics, as a champion of this thing that needs something that you you should act in a particular way, the art that is the project of realism or representational art that has been from this point going backwards has helped people and the culture to understand why they should be acting in a particular way and is not present in these works of modern art. Jackson Pollock. Um, it's, it's just a random scribble, you know. Um, Mark Rothos is even less. It's just squares. Right. And I can totally understand how it fits in to 
what you're saying, uh, and if it was my criticism, if I could just display a little bit of hubris, because, you know, like, um, is, is that... I no, think, you have to agree with everything I say. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> it's, it's really that it, it fits in beautifully with, with what you're seeing as the breakdown of society. Yeah. And so I, I feel that, like, yes, it really, I agree with that. It fits in absolutely beautiful with the decline of the West. Wait, wait, just so I'm clear, what, do, is, what does it fit in with? I'm less these, familiar with these, these contemporary paintings. Art. Uh -huh. Contemporary art. You know, okay. these paintings, the abstract painting mm -hmm. is, is a perfect illustration, is the perfect visual representation of the breakdown of values, gotcha. of the breakdown of conversation, of a, di of, of a dialectic. Plato's dialectic, Hegel's dialectic, uh, Schopenhauer's aesthetics. You know, uh, which I'm. Wait, wait, just so I'm clear, are are you guys saying? And I mean, are you saying that uh, modern c contemporary art, a la Jackson Pollock or or, uh, or Rothko, is a is a is a really great artistic illustration or representation? It's of, a sign of of um, Spenglerian decay. Oh, okay. Because oh, oh, what I was going to say is something yeah. like uh, relativism or something. But is that the wrong word? It's more sp Spenglerian decay. Um, I thought maybe you were. I thought you were saying maybe it's a nice illustration of what um, of postmodern deconstruction or something. Well, like it's that. that too. Okay, you know, it's it's all. I, I guess it's what both. I'm trying. Try it's both. Okay, I'm just trying to understand what it's a good illustration of, basically. So it's both. It is the decay. The, uh -huh. You know, so. Dorian and I differ in that I like the stuff and he doesn't, but I do agree with him that it is. Well, it's a, a sign. So the, the, the artwork. So the oh, artwork cultural. is the the artwork. Looking at the artwork in, in that Heideggerian way uh -huh. is is um, or Ferdinand de Saussure, right? Is is these things are symbols? They're signs of what people believe. Right. So you look at this thing, and it's a symbol. There's that a it, reason. And they believe nothing. Is that yes. okay? Gotcha. Yes. Right. That the intelligentsia has pushed these. Uh, actually, hold on, really quick, because one thing that's coming up here that's interesting to me is um, okay. So when Camille Polly was here, uh, you know, she's talking about how one thing that tends to happen uh, when civilizations enter their decadent phase is that male-female polarity diminishes. Um, and that like sexual devi deviancy becomes normalized, et cetera. Um, and then she was like, you know, I really love the decadent phase. You know, I fit in perfectly in the decadent phase, he said. Um, uh, but, but the more general idea was, you know, th these aren't like autumn and winter aren't to be resisted. It's like you, you, you just need to recognize where you are and recognize that you can't really reverse it, perhaps. I mean, it seems like you're kind of taking the... And Spingler. So Toynbee says you can reverse it. Though. You can reverse it. Toy, Toynbee pushes back so against that. Right. Uh -huh. So he's, what he's seeing as, as the breakdown in society uh, is that it's actually betraying itself. There, that concept of the internal proletariat that's mm -hmm. weakening itself is a betrayal from within. Well, see, I, okay, so like, okay, just building on this a little bit though, like, if I'm honest, um, it does make me sad to see um, like the West lose its vigor. Um, you know, just c comparing us to like, you know, uh, Northern Europe and like the 16 and 1700s, like just the first half of the 18th century, the music that was produced in Germ or what is now Germany, it's just like beyond belief. Um, or like the Dutch masters a couple generations before that. It so it does make me sad to think about the fact that like this is a very kind of artistically, spiritually impoverished time. Um, because John, you were saying like you like you like some of this modern art. In a way, yeah. that sounds to me like... I do you're, like you're, it, insofar as I understand Camille it. Camille Paglia mentality, though. It's like... You need to resist it or get yeah, it. and you're kind of um, like... Because you sort of don't like it. Because you yeah. don't like what's happening. You, no, don't, well, you don't like that we're in the wintry period. You're more like we're in it. Um, and, and, and Toynbee is saying that there, there's a way to resist oh, it. Oh, I know. Okay. okay. Now okay. I know. Now I know what I was going to say. It does, it's not inevitable that yeah. we'll fall. We'll, okay. He he says there's a way. There's a way. Th th that's what I was trying to remember. Okay. So, um, right. So it makes me sad that um, we've lost our artistic spiritual vitality, um, and so. Dorian knows this more than you do, but but I but I really got into Jordan Peterson for a few years. Um, I think his interpretation of the West is extremely different from yours and Spingler's. I mean, he really thinks that like the Judeo-Christian corpus of stories is extremely important. Um, 
of course, he's and he's particularly focused, I think, on well, no, I mean, he thinks it's important not only for preserving the notion of um, the sanctity of the individual from like state violence, because he really hates obviously everything that happened in the 20th century from both the radical left and the radical right. But he also thinks, I think, he thinks like the the Christian narrative is also um, extremely important for the second kind of individualism we were talking about. That is like providing a vision for how individuals should act. I think he, you know, Christ is a great hero in his view, yeah, and sure. as are some of the other uh, figures in the Bible. Anyway, so he thinks, okay, so, so Peterson, very unhappy about trends in the West, right? About uh, the kind of crisis of meaninglessness, of nihilism, a lot of the things we've been talking about. He probably thinks to a greater degree than you might that like the Judeo-Christian uh, stories are absolutely like foundational for the West. No, I agree with that. Okay, okay, this was suggest- okay. pseudomorphic or not, it built, oh, our, it built our civilization. Oh, okay. And it's very important to have a dialogue with those stories. Okay, so then so, I, I so, think everyone should have mm-hmm. read through the Bible. Ideally, mm-hmm. I know it's a tough go. And and increasingly, the the West is biblically biblically illiterate. So yeah, respond in just right. a second the, to finish the point. Like Peterson, what he's trying to do is reverse the trend by revivifying like yeah. the Christian narrative for, again, a scientifically literate um, Western that's, audience. And right? that's very in line with Toynbee. Yeah, but, but, but if I'm honest, I think he's, and, and he's, he's had a lot of, he, he's had remarkable success. I'm not, I'm, not, uh, I'm not saying he hasn't, but to me it just seems like he's ultimately just shouting in the wind that like these four, like that Christianity is, it's basically dead in the West, and maybe it can be. Maybe you can blow on the embers a little bit, but basically, it's gone. And um, I'm more of the mindset that, like, the West is over, and it's useless trying to like revivify it. We should just like accept where we are and maybe like think about what's coming next. Anyway, I'm curious, like, where you. Well, it might be over, but it might not be. I mean, you know, India and China are still there. You know, they went through this phase, their creative phase ended, you know, 15th century, um, and they've been there forever with their values. They still have the same values they had a thousand years ago. That's interesting. Um, so it, that could be the case. The only problem is... But we're demographically... With, with sea level like, rise, though, uh, we're dealing with a whole different ball game that will wipe out our civilization, because all of this, this civilization was built on coastal cities, uh, coastal cities in Europe whether we're talking about Venice and Genoa, whether we're talking about Amsterdam or New York, it was all built on coastal cities. They're all going to be underwater in a few centuries. So uh, the West is going to have to give way to something else. But, but one thing, and one thing I would add to that, I'm curious what you think about this. I mean, also just the, like the demographic that kind of built the West, that gave, you know, Europeans, like we're kind of, like we're not even, like we're becoming minorities in the West, like whether it's the United States or Western Europe. Like there's just a ton of demographic change. Why would we expect the Faustian soul to persist? I'm not sure that I agree with that. Okay, I'm, yeah, no, I'm just please. not sure. Mm-hmm. Um, this is the civilization that brought all these technological miracles. You know, uh, do we really want to put an end to that, or do we want to just follow it through and see how far it goes uh, into artificial intelligence, nanotechnology, genetic engineering? Why not? Let's find out. So we're this far along, we might as well finish no, the game. It's not, a, it's not a normative statement, it's a positive statement. People from different cultures, you know, from, from different culture civilizations, um, are coming into Northern Europe and North America, reproducing in great numbers. Yeah. Like, Northern Europeans, like myself, are reproducing yeah. an increasingly it, low it's number. It's a definite concern, you're right about yeah. that. Taking in, you know, like Syrian refugees into Germany, in droves, uh, what was it, like a million? I mean, yeah, it, it, was, it was a lot. Yeah. And that's pretty reckless because, uh, you well, know, I, mean, just... I, I think Merkel made a big mistake there because these, these people bring with them, they're not just a population, they bring with them a whole sign regime, right. an Islamic sign regime that comes along with them. Uh, you know, there's a lot of complaints um, from people like on the alt-right who complain about uh, whole neighborhoods in Vienna that look like a, a Turkish bazaar, you know, yeah. going, you know, they don't want that, apparently, you know, but there is a concern there, this overcoating, since Islam, after all, its intention all along has been to gobble up the West. That's what the West came into being primarily to resist, those two pinchers coming in on those two flanks up out of North Africa into Spain and, and across uh, the Greek world into Eastern Europe. 
and the West has had to fight against Islam to preserve its identity all along. It's, it's a real pressure there the, between those two pinchers. And so if, now it, are we're going to, we erected, you know, metaphysical dams, let's say, uh, against that. And so with the, these kinds of crises now, we're going to pull down those dams and let all the sign regime that we spent a thousand years resisting. It's a threat. It's a concern. But that presupposes, however, that the Western immune system is weak enough to allow that to happen. Uh, as in the case of the Greeks versus the Persians, um, similar situation there. Um, and they resisted it because their, the Greek sense of self-identity was so incredibly strong. They knew exactly who they were. They knew exactly what their metaphysical ideals were. They weren't about to let somebody take that away from them. I feel the West is equally as strong you as do. the Greeks against the Persians. I, I, this is my feeling. And uh, I don't think it's, I, I can't see it happening. I'm, I'm amazed and kind yeah. of happy to hear that. Yeah. I mean, I like, because cause I, um, I certainly... You're feeling pretty despondent about it. Yeah, that. and I would consider <laughs> I would consider myself part of the strong immune system if mm -hmm. there is one. But um, I just exactly. I just I just don't. I mean, this conversation well, so is a, part of that immune well, system. Yes, I mean, and, but so and, and here's maybe a point in, in favor of that. Um, people generally think of the West, uh, uh, of Greece being uh, Greece in large defending against the Persians, but actually it wasn't. And we've spoken about this before. There were 700 um, polices, 700 city states, and only 31 mm. got to, were able to unite and defend against. So it's always the creative minority. The creative the, minority. Those always, are the 31 that counted, though. It's the thing that we're doing. It's always that small percentage, those people that make the mill series against the larger, you know, really against the larger uh, forces that are pushing. The yep. larger, the forces of entropy and decay are always larger. It's the cre creative minority that stands up and, and is heroic. And that, creates a boundary act. That's right. It's like, stop, no further. Marathon's a boundary act. Yeah. That's Charles Martel stopping the Moors from crossing the Pyrenees. That's a boundary act um, because the cultural immune system is strong enough to uh, create a boundary act. And then Toynbee would jump in to say, it's, it's not... Yeah, what is, what is Toynbee's, like, when you say he doesn't believe that it's inevitable? Oh, yeah, he's, he's more voluntarist, right? He, th he thinks... Well, he's saying that, yeah. like, decay is... Think about... Um, um, one thing, the way I, I think about it is, is uh, you have a set of goals that you're trying to achieve in, in your life. And most people don't betray those goals in one cataclysmic event. But rather, they, they um, kill themselves. They betray themselves one cut at a time. Right, they right. bleed themselves one... You know, every day they do some little thing that undermines that, like, and so that's kind of what Toynbee is saying. It's like this corrosive element that's within culture, you know, that, that riots and does things. It, it, it just, it's, that's the element that's working as, as a destructive force. Yeah. I see the postmodernists as that, mm. you know, and uh, to speak in a kind of gross, like, thing, but. Oh, but to, you don't? To atomize. I'm not sure. What... Well, to atomize culture, to get rid of grand meta narratives, to get rid of the concept, the grand meta narratives, no, you know, that are the thing that knit us together, to give us a point of view. But um, so what Baudrillard would say, which is what um, in Simulacra and Simulation, which mm -hmm. is what the Matrix, which you haven't seen yet, the Amir yeah. Hyde. You haven't um, seen the Matrix? No. What is wrong with you? I have a lot of weird, <laughs> weird lacunae in my. But what he says at the, at the end of the book, in a sense, is is that the perfect sort of uh, image of of modern life is a highway, right? Like little atomized in individual entities, organisms, sort of moving around, going off in their own own. And so Deleuze would say something that like culture is like a rhizome, you know, that things just go off like you know. Just, there's no tree, there's no seed. The concept that, of this thing that there's a seed that grows and gives rise and everything, you can trace everything back to its source. It's craziness. Chaos, modern chaos is too much to be understood. And the abstract paintings mm -hmm. uh, are an example of that. And I think that's what he sees as the brilliant example of that decay. Oh, I see. So like you and like the what? art because it's such a... Right. Such a, and what, Peterson, yeah. what mm -hmm. Peterson's pointing out is like, wait a minute. Yes, that's a point. Yes, the universe is large. And yes, with our science, um, it can look nihilistic. But that doesn't excuse you from the responsibility of making a choice and, and act as if 
the absolute is true. Yeah. So his, and I love that about what he's doing. And I also love that about what Ayn Rand says, that the absolute is life. That you hang that right. thing that you have as a creature of volition, you have to make choices that line up with love. You don't portray something. You don't act, you know, uh, in your own self-interest. Who cares? Willy-nilly. You're just an atomized. You can go shoot somebody. No, you're part of this larger structure. One relevant difference, again, between the West and like China and India is that one, there aren't that many Europeans. It's a, it's a small group and like it's a small group anyway. But furthermore, like like East Asians ferociously resist like immigration to their countries. Yeah. Japan, mm -hmm. South Korea, if we value uh, Faustian civilization, I don't why I don't know why you would assume that a completely altered demography would 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 maintain you know, that mystical idea of infinite space. The West, as Ferdinand Burdell put it, is, is a peninsula of Asia. So it's, it's always been a very small demographic anyway. But that door in the South with Spain has always been open. And uh, we've had lots of ethnicities coming up through North Africa, uh, coming across the Mediterranean, doing business. There's been a lot of ethnic mixing, as a matter of fact, but more so in the South, let's say in the Epimethean half right. of this civilization, then in the Promethean, which tends to be more monoethnic. Um, yeah, so you've got commerce, you've got the Moors going in, you've got Islam. Uh, Spain in the 12th century is a cultural melting pot of Jews, Arabs, Christians, right. all intermixing, interpollinating. Uh, you know, the Jews bring in Kabbalah. Um, we recovered the texts of Aristotle from the Moors uh, coming in. Uh, the, actually, they're Umayyads is what they are. That's a better term. More is kind of an outdated term. Um, the, the Umayyad uh, Arabs are coming in, and they bring with them alchemy. Uh, so we pick up all of our knowledge of alchemy from them, which will later be uh, transformed into, pseudomorphically, transformed into chemistry. Um, basically, the basis of science is brought to us from the Arabs. We get Arabic numerals, which work much better than Roman numerals, as far as we're concerned. Uh, we get um, all these texts of Aristotle that were lost. There were only a couple of them. That becomes the basis for the curriculum of the invention of the university in Paris and in England. Um, and let's take Aristotle, and that's the basis for an academy. Let's rebuild it like it was originally intended to do. Um, all that was brought to us by Islam. So this is why I'm a little hesitant to, and a lot of ethnic intermixing there between right. Jews, Arabs, Christians, of course, uh, Basques, mm -hmm. you, you know, yeah. lots of ethnic mixing going on in the South. The North is a different matter. The North has always been kind of monoethnic. Well, and the flip side of the argument is that in the North is where all the action happens. Yeah, well, like, that's as, where as we get, you know, it's right? like the like, word versus the image, you know, yeah. we, we get the printing press, we get the Protestant and iconism that wipes the the narratives clean from the walls of the churches. Okay, that's out of the way. Now what we can invent new iconotypes. Uh, it's more forward thinking, just it's Promethean, exactly like what uh, Toynbee says it is. Um, science, all, you know, most of the great scientific transformations other than Galileo uh, and Leonardo come out of that. Um, yeah, it's true. The North, uh, the, you know, the, the great, it's not an accident that the great scientists, you know, at the turn of the 20th century are all German. Uh, the great musicians, the classical musicians, they're all German. Yeah, uh, yeah you, but, have, but, you have a point. But, to the, but, to uh, but the, the South has made major contributions as well, cathedrals. Well, that's what I was, I was just going to say, like, right, because the one, the one real, like, huge problem with that line of argumentation that I was just impersonating is that, like, right, the cathedrals, which is sort of the precursor, right? I mean, because, you, because Spingler would draw a connection between the cathedral, the infinite space of the yeah, cathedral, with, with all of the art that followed in Northern Europe. Yep. And, right, and, and, of, and as, you, as you said, and it's not just France, it's Spain. I mean, Spain is like the land Francis, of cathedrals, yep, right? Exactly. Yeah, okay, interesting, right. And, and, in right. many ways, they're, the early centuries of Faustian civilization belong to France and Spain. Yeah, see, they I are, they, that's where about, the creative yeah. weight is. Yeah. For like the first half, the, sh the turning point comes with the, the Protestant revolt, the 17th century, and it shifts to the Dutch. Now it begins to shift to the north, to England and uh, Amsterdam. Then that begins, from that point on down to let's say 1900, the, yeah, the creative weight is in the, in the north and then the, the past becomes regarded as a fossil. They're stuck in Catholicism. They're, you know, they're stuck looking back at old, outdated Mediterranean culture forms. You know, what's, what kind of new stuff has come out of Spain in that second oh, 500 nothing. years? You know, yeah, it's, the, Italy too, you know, after the Renaissance, they become fossils, yeah. frozen, locked in place. 
uh, petrified. And then all the creative stuff is going on in the North with science and uh, the yeah. Protestant outbreak. But, th but this is a real step in that conversation. Like, I mean, what you, like the kind of pushback you gave to the pessimistic story I was giving. Like, that, as you say, there was so much synthesizing and fusing of cultures in, in Southern Europe, and that Southern Europe was critical, in fact, pri like prior. It was sort of the first great exponent of yeah. Faustian forms. Okay, yeah, that's... Uh, right. Yeah, that does give reason. I'm not as worried that. about it as you are. I, I think the West is incredibly strong. and Its immune system, uh, I think, will take care of it for quite a long time. Interesting. I'm not worried. Hmm. Interesting. Hmm. Okay. That's very hopeful. It's, it's a tough civilization. Because yeah. um, I think in one of your hypermodernity pod, and I still don't know what that term means, hypermodernity, but like, uh, and I think in one of the podcasts, um, you guys were talking about African Americans in the United States, and you described you described them as deworlded. I think. Um, well, in the sense that they've been removed from their homeland, right. and they constitute. Toynbee calls them an internal proletariat in the West because of that fact that to, they, to, to they are deworlded in a sense. And do, that, do you think that like largely remains true to this day, or to but, some extent? You know, I, there again, it's sort of making my point though that I was just making about Europe. Here we have uh, a totally alien ethnicity to the West who's deworlded lifted up, brought into our civilization, are they a threat? No, what happens is jazz, rock and roll, Harlem, the Harlem Renaissance, you know, um, no, there's not, they, they may remain an internal proletariat with their own identity, but they've created so much of American popular culture, uh, there's been a kind of a fusion. Uh, that sign regime has gotten taken up and embedded and intermixed with uh, what was there in America. I think, it's, I think it's both, I think there's definitely that. And again, even like a lot of the great kind of, um, you know, black identitarian leaders like MLK very much like bought into foundational American values. But now I see, I mean, a lot of the racial division in the United States seems a little like it worries me. Like, I think that it's um, uh, it's in direct opposition. Yeah. Um, I mean, there's a there's a very strong kind of anti-white, anti-Western um, like, anti-white, anti-Western amongst who, though? Well, the whole concept of the black identity as formed out of um, Malcolm X is in opposition to the white identity. Right, I mean... I mean well, the more are, radicalized elements, like Malcolm X was well, a radicalized that's what we're seeing, that's uh, what we're seeing today. But, that, but, that, but, I'd, but I'd say it's pretty mainstream, at least uh, in progressive circles today, this way of thinking, um, the kind of normalization of anti-white racism, um, pulling down statues that represent kind of old Hopefully American ideas. Hopefully it's idea. just a, it'll pass. It's just a, it's a, like a, a fever. Yeah, yeah, you know, so it'll, perhaps it will. It's a sickness that it will pass. M maybe I'm just I'm hoping things will yeah. get back to normal and that it's not gonna spread like he's been talking about, that this may be a new internal proletariat that's here to stay. I hope not. Um, I don't think that that will be the case. But See, um, there is. Uh, Problems that give rise with, with hypermodernity, as you're saying, like globalism, as you have in your hypermodernity book, um, is, and as Daryl points out in, in his whole history of like 20th century history, is, is this internal proletariat, these people that were brought over first as slaves or the minorities that exist in our culture that have now found themselves in a world where um, there's really nothing for them. You know, that's really difficult. They can't really, part of their identity as pushing against white culture has, has put them in a place um, as globalism is, is, is moving forward where they're in cities that there are no jobs for them. And, and all the jobs that were there, the middle class jobs uh, have been exported and they're being automated. So that, that formula seems, appears to me to be a very dangerous Yeah, once you get setting. an out of work internal proletariat than You're those problems. Yeah, that's trouble. happened in and, the classical world too. And that's happening. A lot of soldiers return from wars and their lands are gone. Now what do they do? They revolt. Yeah. Yeah. I, th I think one thing we should say about the D world thing is that like African Americans, they don't, they go back to, you know, West Africa. They, that feels more alien to them yeah. than, yeah. Um, so, so, so kind of mainstream American culture. Now, obviously, you know, someone like Obama, an increasing percentage of African Americans are totally assimilated into kind of mainstream American culture, but there's still a fairly large group that really is like a just very different spiritually, linguistically, obviously phenotypically. Um, and there, I, I would just say to the extent that they can, they have created their own world.
right? Like the black American world, like in, you know, it's, it's a younger world, right? Yeah. But it, it goes back a few hundred years, right? right. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and to the extent that they have a world at all, because it's not West Africa and it's, no, not, so. it's not mainstream American culture, but, when, it, it, but it is like, you know. And when they tried to make it West Africa with Liberia, the whole yeah. thing was an absolute disaster. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. But anyway. Yeah, I, I don't know why, why I got off on that. I don't know, but yeah. I'm also not as confident as you are um, uh, regarding Spain because I, I think Spain happened to sort of just get lucky with being some of the first to um, come over with the New World and their exploration and that kind of thing. Um, and that whole setup, and I know that, that Spangler would probably see this as proximal causes, um, you know, the, the accident of, of um, Tours, the Battle of Tours, and defending that, and that things are just going the way they're going to go anyhow. Um, but, uh, I mean, that sort of dismisses the, the great man, you know, great heroic man, like, part of, of history. And I think um, Spain, having found, been the first to, to get all these riches, it basically wrecked them. But, but, but a lot of the significant stuff that Spain did, I think you were saying, came before all of that, right? I mean, the cathedral building, right? Like, No, it's, a, it's almost simultaneous. 12th, yeah. All this is in the 12th century. Well, no, because the, the, because the discovering of colonial riches came far after that. 1490. Yeah. Um, right. 1492. But, but I think like the... Like, you but know, the battles, when they well, really the colonial started... riches, now you're talking about the, the Portuguese and right. well, navigators. That, that's what you were just talking about. Yeah. Right? And, right, but I think at that point, Spain, I mean, Spain was already passed, like, right, the, like again like the really important i mean i think kind of you could say like the second half of the second millennium belonged to northern europe and yeah. faustian world but That's the right. first the first half of the first millennium the pre, pre yeah right and again cathedrals is probably the single best like yeah. illustration in spain yeah, absolutely. Right. and i mean i traveled in spain for five weeks every single like medium-sized city or bigger that you go to has yeah. just an and all the grail romances and the arthurian romances came out of france by the way um, so it wasn't just the cathedrals, it was also the literature yeah, as oh, well okay. mm -hmm. coming into being. Yeah. Um, it's interesting that the best ones, though, were the German response to that with Wolfram von Eschenbach's version of Parsifal and Gottfried von Strasberg's version of Tristan and Isolde. Those become like what I call in my book Art After Metaphysics, the apotheosis of an iconotype. Leonardo apotheosizes the iconotype of The Last Supper. It's done. You're not going to ever get it better than the way he did it. So, you know, Michelangelo apotheosizes the image of Yahweh as this bearded creator guy. That's it. You know, that iconotype is yeah. done. Same, th same thing with the Grail romances. They originate uh, in, in the, coming in and around Paris, um, Crichton de Troyes, guys like that, a uh, whole bunch of them. They're all French. They're all French. And then at the tail end of that, you get the, the, really the best exemplars are the Germans saying, hmm, we think we can better this. And they did. And then the whole thing gets shut down, 1210 or so-ish, uh, by you know, the church. And they start cracking down, um, put an end to it. But yeah, the creative spirit definitely is coming from the south there. Uh, and the troubadours are also uh, adaptations of uh, Spanish Arabic uh, types of troubadours, the, the traveling singer. Oh, interesting. Uh, that's also come up from North Africa to, to Spain. So yeah, there's a huge creative force going on there uh, in Spain and France uh, for, yeah, for the first half uh, until the navigators get going. Right about 1500, then you know the Venetians and the Genoans are like, Islam's in the way of trade. We need to go around Islam, around Africa, to get to India and keep these signifiers coming in. And along with the goods, the spices that they're going after, that rosewood and salt and pepper, all these things that they're grabbing, ambergris, bringing this stuff in, come cultural signifiers as well that are, they're bringing back. Look at this weird statue I found. You know, those signifiers start coming in uh, 1500. And as you start to get, whenever you get a signifier surplus, Let's, let's call it a semiotic excess, as the, my friend the poet Michael Aaron Caymans calls it. A semiotic excess. you got to do something, because now you've got uh, Georges Bataille's accursed share. You've got, you're burdened with an accursed share, so what do you do with this signifier overload? We'll start putting it in cabinets. Now we've got curiosity cabinets. Uh, pretty soon, aristocrats and palaces have 
curiosity rooms. <laughs> By the 19th century, now we get museums. museums. Ah. So that signifier overload gets channeled into the creation eventually of museums. Well, we've got collections of signifiers from all over the world. Um, but yeah, it, but those signifiers coming in, that, that also overcodes Europe with new uh, ideas. Uh, other cultures have other ideas. Shakespeare responds to this discovery of the new world by writing The Tempest. You know, oh, there's this new romanticism of this new place that's this utopian place. Now we can send immigrants over. Uh, if you're unhappy here, go there. And uh, so it becomes a whole new signifier overload uh, that Europe plays with, interacts with, uh, cross-pollinates with, and all kinds of new culture forms come into being from 1500 on. So it's interesting the way that uh, Euro-American history has this threshold at right about the year 1500 things start changing, the weight shifts from the south to the north, uh, and then moves you know, west to America, and, you know, the 19th century, and so forth. One nuance I wanted to ask you about going back about 30 minutes is, um, so uh, I guess I was drawing a kind of crude distinction between thinking that Judeo-Christian, like uh, the Judeo-Christian tradition is foundational to the west, uh, and the notion that no, like it's it's the idea of infinite space that like arose in the organic or sorry in the Germanic forest, um, like that it's one or the other. That either like the Judeo-Christian tradition is foundational and primary, or it's not important at all. And and but you kind of introduced a nuance, like you were saying. Well, no, I mean even even if you agree with like the Spinglerian view of the West, it's not as if the Judeo-Christian tradition is unimportant. I, I I just wanted to ask you to elaborate on that a little bit, like. Um, you don't just think it's an overlayer of an ear that kind of needs to be set aside in order no. to truly understand what's going on. No, I don't. Can you just elaborate a little no, bit? No, because yeah. the whole culture was built out of the yeah. Judeo-Christian insight, that whole cosmology. Um, you can't just take that away. Even though it's, it may be pseudomorphic, it, it's not Scandinavian mythology, but nonetheless, it came in as a new sign regime that sort of shoved Scandinavian, the native uh, sign regime aside. There, there are two processes when uh, cultures come across uh, there's a process which comes from the Scandinavian land nama, which means land naming and claiming. So you get a, a new population bringing in a new sign regime that names and claims an area. Um, you know, those three, there's three trees on that hill. We'll call it Golgotha Hill. So there's an overcoding process that takes place. But then the reverse process underneath is, a, is known as acculturation, where you have people who have been in the landscape there already, native for the longest period of time, then there's this process where the incoming sign regime gets uh, fused together mm. and digested slowly and dissolved because the older sign regime is stronger because mm. it's been there longer. It's more rooted in the land. This is why I talk about you know comic book superheroes, for instance. Are most of them are or a lot of them are Native American characters? Spider-Man, yeah. Wolverine, Wasp, Ant-Man. Um, all those characters are, were in Batman, were all in Native American culture, and they, it's, it's a mysterious process of acculturation, how they just, you know, Wait, they push the their way up through the crust of this alien white sign regime. Yeah. Uh, but it's a hybrid, you know, with the, the white sign regime brings in Superman, which is basically just Samson, uh, Hercules, Gilgamesh, you know, Thor, the Loki. Um, so it becomes a fusion of two different sign regimes that take place at the level of folk culture. Uh, not at the level of highbrow stuff. And it's a totally naive process of hybridization. Uh, but it doesn't matter because these are larger cultural forces that just sort of, it's like they have their own mind. They work it, you know, work well, themselves out. One specific question on that point. I mean, but Native Americans are just completely obliterated. So how is it that, yeah, yeah, how, right, how is it that right. like Native But their Americans... myths are rooted in the land. That's oh, the whole thing. I see, oh, I see. All their right. myths are like, they, they come out of the soil. They come out of the trees. They come out of the ground. The yeah. myths are, you uh. know, Actually course, rooted in the lands. Well, and that's like that's like so, I mean, in Sp right? Sp and that's what Spingler says, right? That that each is, is the is the term iconotype. Is that your term? I invented that. Yeah, that and that that's term. That's my term. Wait. So what's um, what's the word just for the fundamental idea of the civilization that Spingler talks about? Is that what an iconotype is? Or? Uh, no, that's no, just an, an ur oh, symbol. Okay. It's it's an ur symbola, so it's an ur symbol. Wait. So w remind me, what is an iconotype? Well, an iconotype is a term that I invented to describe uh, not an archetype. Ar the Jungian archetypes of the collective unconscious are universal. Oh, they're ethnically like, like, specific. They're culturally specific archetypes. Well, th th like the virgin birth is universal, let's say. You can find it in all the civilizations. But an iconotype I invented to refer to that particular um, type 
that gets reiterated within a particular time and a particular place. Right. A window, let's say, from ah, right. okay. Byzantine iconotypes get reiterated over and over again as the Last Supper, the crucifixion, the beheading of John. Those are iconotypes um, because they are the obsessive. You can't paint during that epoch from, let's say, uh, 11 or 1200 to 1500 without painting one of those iconotypes. Mm. Take your pick, which one you want, but you can't invent your own uh, until that changes slowly over time with the Renaissance and Leonardo and Michelangelo and Raphael come in and apotheosize and exhaust those iconotypes. And in the process of doing that, they semantically deplete them. So I have this theory that iconotypes have a certain potential energy in them that uh, through their repetition, the repetition isn't infinite. Uh, it's, it's, it's got a certain energy potential that will eventually be semantically depleted. And when an iconotype becomes semantically depleted, you really can't do anything with it anymore. So new iconotypes have to come in. And at that point, the Dutch bring in the iconotype of infinite space in painting. It's already been there in the cathedrals, but now it's in painting. Uh, all you see in Dutch canvases is the sky. That's, that's it. And the, the land is this narrow strip, but also the still life. Uh, that also comes in with the Dutch and, above all, the portrait study, which becomes the transformation of Christ, as Deleuze and Guattari call him in A Thousand Plateaus, the average white man, the Christian iconotype painting visages, uh, you know, the Byzantine Christ that is an iconotype that we inherit, paint obsessively. And then pretty soon Albrecht Durer plugs himself into that iconotype and we get his self-portrait uh, where it used to be Christ, and he's plugging himself into that iconotype. Pretty soon, the, the portrait of the unique individual now, mm -hmm. and so here we are back to the myth of the individual, comes in as an iconotype to replace images of saints, and uh, that becomes the new iconotype. The portrait study. Oh, look at this, you know, Giovanni Bellini's Doge Lordano, or uh, Jan van Eyck's uh, self-portraits of wealthy burghers, that becomes a new thing, the, the individual as a metaphysical entity unto himself. Um, this is new. This, whoever thought of this before? So that portrait study goes all the way down to modernism, where it starts to become deconstructed by Picasso and the modernists uh, and Francis Bacon wiping visages and blurring them. Uh, it slowly becomes, again, semantically depleted and wiped out. Who wants to see a portrait study now? I mean, it doesn't mean anything to us anymore. It's semantically depleted. So that's how these processes work across and, time. And just so I'm clear, like the, 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 each civilization's Ur idea, whether it's like infinite space or the cave or the body, um, like to what, um, do they kind of come out of the land according yeah. to Spengler? Yes, they do. Or is it more of like a somewhat random interaction between the land, which is fixed, but like the, the, also the minds of the people? No, it's, a, it's an interaction between a population that has been in that landscape for a long, long time okay. and the land itself. Um, there's a reason why the uh, Apollonian archetype of the Greeks is focused on the body, the, the sunny Mediterranean where everything is very clear. It's not a stormy place at all. Everything is very clear, the near, the present, the physical, the tangible. Uh, whereas in the stormy climate of the West, we get infinite space, you know, these constant thunderstorms that are striking these trees. Uh, and pretty soon you get this idea of expansion into the infinite, these mighty forests. Uh, like but the something. weird thing is that that's more the Northern Europe, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and we were it, talking right. about how like the stuff started in Southern Europe. It did, yeah. That's, so, isn't that a little weird? Or? Some of these processes are mysterious. <laughs> I, I can't explain everything. <laughs> I'm, I'm doing my best it. here. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, because I was remembering like you talked about the Germanic forest as sort of like the part of the landscape. Yeah, that, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, and I was trying to relate that to the case. Okay, so how did the Gothic cathedrals like, yeah. come to Spain? Well, oh. somehow it includes the South yeah. as well. Yeah. I'm not sure. but yeah. No, no, fair enough. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's... yeah so we're, we're coming to the end. Uh, I guess Dorian and I both have a few more questions we want to ask. But, um, and if you want to give like quick answers or whatever, just... Um, okay, so uh, most important thing that Spingler gets right and most important thing mm -hmm. that he gets wrong in your view. Oh, well, the most important thing that Spengler gets right is the fact that uh, civilizations are mortal. They all die. They all die. It may be uh, a death of petrifaction, as in, in the case of India and China, or in our case, getting gobbled up by the barbarians, or the Byzantine civilization getting gobbled up by the Ottoman Empire. But one way or another, uh, all civilizations are mortal. So I think that's his best insight. His worst insight uh, is probably uh, he didn't understand modern art at all. 
He had nothing but scorn for it. I think he missed the boat on that. I think that's, uh, yeah, it may be art that occurs within a decadent epoch, but I still think uh, it's great. And um, he thought, you know, Wagner was the last great musician and Impressionist art was the last great art. Um, I find that a little bit, <laughs> he missed the boat there. One really interesting thing I heard you say, and maybe you're just repeating what Spingler said, is that um, as, as a country's, or sorry, as a civilization's, um, I don't know if you'd say iconotype, but just as its artistic possibilities become exhausted, as it advances, what you see, you know, it, it just flowed out of Bach and Mozart. It's like they couldn't write oh, yeah. the music fast enough, whereas you get right, the, exactly. the romantics and, and Wagner. It's like Whereas with Beethoven, Beethoven it's right, starting it's like, to become a struggle. Right. It's, like it's not your, flowing. Your it's a, yeah. that's, that's a significant thing. Yeah. That Beethoven, you know, it was a wrestle for him, but not for Mozart, Bach, or... And for Fox Wagner, too, or, for Wagner too, it was like a. It was also a wrestle, yeah. And he he could only do a few, and yep. right, yeah. And you can, and then you get to Mahler. He's got ten symphonies, yeah. and they're, that's it, you right? Know, ten symphonies, and they're really kind of messy. They're uh -huh. they're very chaotic the way they're organized. Um, yeah, you can hear it winding down. It's, so, Dorian, you're kind of Spinglerian in your view of modern art. Would that be correct? I mean, the, well, like, the, yeah. like the difference yeah, yeah. that I mean, he well, just described is like very some, similar to the difference between you sure, two we're talking sure. about. Sure, right? sure. So there's something that, that I don't like about the breakdown and the, the decay. Right. You know, there's something that, say, um, John likes horror movies, right? And, and, uh, and, and horror novels. And, and he likes, like, it, he can see what's happening in society and the breakdown and see the symbol and go, that's a damn good symbol of that thing. And I don't like the breakdown. So I think Spengler didn't like to break down, you know, and, and uh, it's probably why I lean more towards conserving, conserving uh, things, you know, because uh, there's something that I think is worth conserving. I'm not okay with the breakdown of values. You, you know, I think people should and should act in a particular way. Did you tell John about my favorite horror movie, the one that I recommended to you? What I'm, is almost, it? I'm almost certain you like it. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's it's barely it's it's not even necessarily accurate to call it call it a horror movie. It may be my favorite movie of all time, The Wicker Man. Oh yeah, yeah. the original. Yeah, seven. Yeah, 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 the original, not the remake. No, I haven't Remake's even seen terrible. the remake. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's a great film. God, I that love was that an movie. amazing movie. Yeah, absolutely. Like it's for so That's many. It's a classic seventies horror film. Movie. Yeah. it's just so seventies. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. So well written. The yeah. music is beautiful. In many ways, the seventies was like the again the apotheosis of the horror iconotype. Mm -hmm. All the best horror movies date pretty much from the 70s, from Rosemary's Baby, let's say, in 1968, all the way down to The Shining in 1980. Yeah. You know, that's bookended very neatly by those two films. Both of those are amazing, yeah. too. I, um, yeah, but, I mean, one thing I, it's, like, I don't read about horror movies, so this is probably, like, a completely, like, obvious observation, but, like, um... A lot of the ones that I've seen are all about like the death of Christianity and kind of hidden occult right. pagan forces. Right, right. And it's the, 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 the disintegration like of a, that of that pseudomorphic layer of yeah. Christianity crumbling, and then what's underneath it is all these pagan, you know, yeah. deities. Right. Uh, the, the, the horror right. of these, right. <laughs> right. you know, these the Wicker Man. Yes, exactly. The human sacrifice. And it's always, druids. That's and, always at the uh, center. Like, have you seen yeah. True Detective season one? Yeah, yeah. Totally, that was great. This, totally the same. Yeah, exactly the thing. same. Yeah. Totally. That was a great. Uh, show first seven episodes man yeah unbelievable that, that's Absolutely. the best tv i've ever seen and the chemistry that. between those two actors you know woody harrelson and uh matthew mcconaughey, McConaughey yeah. it, it, just a fantastic Unbe unbelievable <laughs> best buddy mo movie ever buddy cop yes know, movie ever just, it's almost weird even yeah. to use that term but yeah yeah like, yeah like it a, is a little yeah, awkward yeah, but, but it's pretty much what it is but it totally is yeah all right cool oh, wait uh, hang sorry. on just oh, before yeah. you go with that because I, I think um another thing that spangler got wrong is is and you've mentioned this in the past is um, he didn't believe in the American project at all. No. There's a bunch of dollar... What is dollar it? trappers. Dollar trappers. No past, no, no future. future. One yeah. line. And, and, no, <laughs> and he also didn't... He no also, art. No art. Well, I mean, like, well, that's what he meant. We're, we're, much, we're yeah. Rome. Yeah. We're Rome. We're yeah. Rome, exactly. Right. And, yeah. and didn't really consider cinema as a form of art. No. You know, no. So that's another... He, you know what he compared it to were the mime shows, the, uh, the classical mime shows, uh -huh. which right. aren't... Mimes in the sense of pretending you're in a fake box. They were actually plays. Um, they were plays that were done uh, like their equivalent of television. I think television would be a better analogy. Just local social problems with silly stereotypical characters. Um, I don't think any of them have survived. We just know of them, but we don't know particular ones. 
Uh, but yeah, that's what he compared cinema to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But so, see, I, but I don't really disagree with Spengler about America. I mean, I, I, I like the ideals in our Constitution, but I, but I, I agree with him that like we don't have any kind of deep, beautiful, inspiring, no. meaningful artistic tradition. I mean, no, to the extent that we do, it's just it's our it's our ancestors. Probably say the same thing yeah. about America that he said about Rome, where he said. I could care less for Roman art, Roman plays. What I admire about Rome are their engineering yes. achievements, the, the, the aqueducts and the Colosseum. I would much rather, if I was living in Rome, I would much rather be an engineer yeah. than, a, than a hapless, unfortunate poet. You know? And, and I, I would add one thing to that, which is a little deeper, you know, like, because you know, there's kind of the art and the unarticulated, and then like, the layer right above might be what you articulate <clears throat> philosophically. I do think what we articulated in the Constitution is pretty special. Yes. Um, and you know that that arose out of a of an unarticulated culture that comes like from parts of Europe. But I, so so in addition to our engineering, I would say some of our philosophical articulation in this country and our founding documents is also is also well. Rome. And a lot of yeah. that is f copied from the Roman it's, political machinery, as described by Polybius in his history, where he lays out the system of checks and balances. The founding father had re founding fathers had read Polybius. And they based the structure of our government on that system of checks and balances right. that eliminate uh, any possibility of a monarchy. Uh, the major difference being they had two presidents, two consuls, that could check each other's powers, uh, except in the case of a state of emergency. If that happens, then uh, one consul can then take charge, override the Senate, override checks and balances, and make decisions very quickly. Because if you're in a maximal stress situation, you don't have time you to have debate. Two, you, you know, it's like the Star Wars prequels, you know. Our, my people are dying and you guys are sitting here debating what to do. We need somebody to take charge right now and take care of this. But then the state of emergency is, uh, as Carl Schmidt talks about in political theology, this is what gives rise to Caesars. This is how they come into being. Mm -hmm. they, it's, a, it's a crisis of opportunity for them. Right. Like Sulla in Rome is the first after the first phase of Roman civil wars, to come out of that and go, Phew, now we got that taken care of. By the way, I'm maintaining permanent uh, dictatorial powers. So in a way, he's th the first Caesar, uh, uh, the first one to assume permanent powers as a dictator for, for life. There's no election. Uh, you know, I think the consuls, if I remember right, were only in for one year. Um, and they, so they changed on an annual basis. But uh, Sulla is like, you're not... Believe me, this is if I if if, if I give power away uh, to another consul, we're going to go right back to civil wars and anarchy. And everybody's like, you know, he's right. He's got a point. Um, so they they were like, okay, lead us. That's fine. But then after him, then it goes back to checks and balances for a while until the first triumvirate comes. You know, Caesar, Crassus, and Pompey that I was describing last night. Right, uh, right. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that was interesting. And weaving Trump in. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right, so uh, let's see. Um, oh, yeah, I already told you I was going to ask you this. Um, of, uh, of Spengler's nine culture slash civilizations, what is your favorite? What is your least favorite? <laughs> well, favorites uh, for different reasons. Uh, my favorite for spirituality is India. Mm. I, I think that uh, India got it right as far as what I've learned about uh, reincarnation and karma. I think they, they came the closest to getting it right. Um, but as far as like just, you know, a favorite, ours, I love ours. I love all these gadgets and machines that stress me out. And, you know, I throw oh, you tantrums do? and... Oh, you, 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 wait, so are you more into sci-fi or fantasy? Sci-fi. Okay, so you're more into the future than the... Past. Yeah, well, into I like machines, even though I have a love-hate relationship with them, uh -huh. um, and I'm always breaking them and throwing them. And <laughs> See, but nonetheless, they're they're fucking miracles. I mean, it's, it amazes me that we figure this shit out. I, I, I'm blown away by it too, but I think I'm probably of a more Spinglerian disposition. Like I, like I, I vastly prefer kind of fantasy, and more specifically, just like medieval. Tolkien? Like, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like, I like Tolkien a lot. Game of Thrones, much more than like sci-fi. Yeah. And... I've read all of Tolkien's stuff. Mm. Yeah, it's pretty good stuff. Um, his feat of saving and preserving Anglo-Saxon mythology, which if you go back and you look at uh, ang what's there of Anglo-Saxon texts, it's not much. You get like an anthology, and there's a few poems, uh, and then the best of it is, of course, Beowulf. Right. And he sort of started as a Beowulf scholar. He has this famous series of lectures on Beowulf, and he translates Beowulf. He has a, a really good translation. It's a prose tr a translation, but it's really good. And when I was doing these uh, YouTube uh, discussions on Beowulf, Tolkien was my primary source for oh, my wow. information. Um, I was using his lectures, his translation, 
and his references, he tells you which scholars are the great Beowulf scholars. So I went and got those guys and read through them. And <laughs> I got pretty intense on Beowulf. I only made it like halfway through Is it. Is Beowulf where we first, our first knowledge of the weird? Yeah. Mm -hmm. The first time the word weird, W-Y-R-D, as it was spelled then, occurs. Uh, when in the second half, uh, Beowulf seems to have been two totally different stories that were stitched together. Uh, the first one with Grendel and the mother, and then the second one with the dragon. And it's in the second one where it says, uh, and then he went out to meet his weird, his destiny, which is his own unique destiny to fight the dragon. Um, yeah, so that's the first occurrence of it. Okay, so, so weird is not the dragon. It is No, it's destiny. destiny. It's okay. the Faustian destiny right, idea right. that corresponds to the Greco-Roman Moira uh -huh. or right, right. let's say okay. know, the yeah. Arabian Kismet or As you were saying Hindu yesterday. karma, uh -huh. or, you know, like that. Okay. Um, oh, least favorite culture civilization. Least favorite? Oh, God, I like them all. It's <laughs> pr probably China, I guess, if I was forced. But, you know, I've always been a little uncomfortable. I've studied Chinese history quite, quite a bit. I know a lot about it, but um, there's something about it that never quite clicks with me. Um, I respect it, and you know it's great. And one interesting, probably China. One interesting kind of minor critique I think you have of Spengler is that he doesn't recognize that Mesoamerican forms are very influenced by by Chinese by Chinese uh, yeah. civilization. That's a a big no no in American anthropology to even suggest that. I remember when I wrote a review of a book about the Olmecs on Amazon. Um, and I got this uh, guy, I think he was an American anthropologist who left a comment. You don't know what you're talking about. The Chinese, Chinese civilization had no influence whatsoever. Uh, oh, yes, it most certainly did. The culture forms are too similar for it to be an accident. Um, if, and if, the if, dates... If, if a viewer wants, um, if a viewer of this wants to like see evidence of that, what would you point them to? Is there, are there any two, well, two particular well, images? Yeah, that sure. You would, yeah. Look at the... Um, the use of turquoise and the creation of uh, turquoise jaguar faces corresponds to their uh, turquoise dragons and tigers in, that you find in China. Mm -hmm. The way the cities are aligned on a north-south axis is exactly the same as in China. Um, burying the dead with a piece of jade in the mouth uh, to give immortal life to the dead, that's a common practice that they have. Um, and just the look of, there are Olmec statues, the Olmec date from 1200 B.C., the Chinese Shang Dynasty from 1500, so that they're temporally very close. And um, the figurines that the Olmecs have, they, some of them look like Chinese guys. Mm. Just look at the figurines. Mm. They, they look like Chinamen. Um, so clearly something happened, some sort of exportation uh, from the Shang Dynasty. Maybe it, it was a group that was exiled uh, and anathematized by a new emperor coming in. That, Maybe it was a disaffected proletariat that left, went across, the, wandered, and found that, hey, here's some land, let's start this, let's do our own thing. Again, like we were talking about before, when a disaffected internal proletariat uh, in these small villages, I was looking at villages in Mesopotamia, such as Abu Huraira, and then like uh, you get this village that's up and running for a while, and then one appears 25 miles to the north, and another one 25 miles to the south after a couple of centuries, you have to start to wonder, did a group of guys go, we don't like the way the, this leader is making these decisions, so they leave and they go and found their own village. And that's the way culture works. So a lot of it comes out of disaffected proletariats and disputes and disagreements. Right. Well, if you don't like it, then go found your own yeah. colony. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of civilization has evolved out of disputes like that. That's perfect. Actually, maybe I'll jump in with, yeah. uh, with my question. Um, maybe one of my last questions is, as that culture that initially spread out, because there was enough land and there was enough territory and there was enough, there were enough resources that they didn't have to fight over, um, one of them becomes more confident and, and they start to spread because they multiply. As they are doing well, they just multiply. And, and because of that, they spread out. And then they're having to conquer these other territories that had their own sign regimes, their own cultural sign regimes. And they're either, well, the history of it is that they're enslaving them. You know, so, uh, or they're using them for sacrifice or they're doing, in some way, um, those, those people that have been conquered become part of the internal proletariat. And I'm, I'm kind of wondering is as the culture becomes more confident in itself and it becomes more tolerant of these people that it's conquered and it, and it becomes more di diverse. This almost seems to me like like Spangler's like whole arc 
And you become more confident, you become more tolerant, you allow more people into your place. The more people you allow, the more diversity you, you have, you sort of weaken the, the general initial set of ideas. Um, and then those fractions that you've conquered become little entities in and of themselves that push back eventually because now you're not as strong as you were. You're not inspiring them. They push back. They don't have anything to, to be drawn to. They want to have their own identity and it starts welling up out of them. They push back and the whole thing collapses. Yeah. I mean, you see that with uh, what Alexander did, you know, taking the Greek uh, cult world of culture forms. Uh, in a certain sense, he's not Greek. He's Macedonian, but nonetheless, different ethnicity, but still Greek. Uh, he's carrying Greek culture forms with him. The pushback against the Persians, uh, it pushes back against them, conquers the Middle East, goes all the way to northern India, and then comes back and conquers uh, Egypt. So now we have this whole new Hellenistic ecumeny where we have this overlay of Hellenistic Greek culture forms over a vast uh, swathe of territory. I mean, it's, it's really huge. But then after his death, then it breaks down into three different groups, the Antigonids in uh, Asia Minor, and the Seleucids across the Middle East, who are ruling over the Persians now, uh, Greeks ruling over Persians, and the Ptolemies in Egypt, who have taken control there, and they conscript the Egyptian fellahin into their military to fight their wars against the Seleucids in the Middle East, because the Ptolemies and the Seleucids are constantly at war with each other. It's like Athens and Sparta, um, just constantly at war with each other over fighting for possession of the Middle East. And yeah, that's exactly what happens. These these uh, poor and Egyptian peasants. Uh, why do we have to go fight the Seleucids? You know, because we're not Greek. We're Egyptian. Um, so it's exactly your point. Uh, it's a concrete illustration of it. And that sort of backs up your sort of pessimism about where we're going. Yeah, I guess. Yeah, I am. Um, although again, this conversation it's been a nice corrective to some of my more pessimistic thoughts because they're pretty ignorant um, and not particularly well thought out. So, um, okay, just a couple more here. Um, okay, yeah, I'm just gonna. Well, th three, and I'm gonna start with this one. This is the last kind of substantive Spengler-related one. Um, so. Uh, do you think we're seeing the birth of a new culture civilization? If so, is there anything that you can say about it? And how would you relate your answer to something I think I heard Joseph Campbell say, which is that like we don't yet have a myth for the kind of contemporary period? No, uh, yeah. no, because it's he said because things are changing too fast, uh, and myth requires a stability, a culture isolated in a particular time and place uh, that's stable enough to produce a, a new myth. Uh, but... Um, it is possible that we are entering a, a second axial age. The, uh, Carl Jaspers called the first axial age um, from 500 BC to 200 BC, where you get all these prophets across the board, Lao Tzu and Confucius in China, uh, Pythagoras, and uh, you know, going across the board, all these sages, Yojnavalkya in India, teaching yoga. Um, and it becomes an axial age where all these individual guys have broken away from the state apparatus to teach you the individual, a means of self-salvation. You don't need the priests for this. We can teach you yoga. Lao Tzu can teach you how to go build your own private community in the woods, or Pythagoras go found his own colony uh, in Croton. Um, but uh, if we're entering a new axial age, it has to be planetary in scale this time. So um, it is possible that we might be seeing the emergence of a planetary scale culture that's new and will unify all these dying behemoths in the same way that the first generation of civilization was, uh, you know, the Sumero babylonian and the Egyptian world. Then you get to the second generation after the Indo-Aryan invasions come down from the north and they seed these societies, the, the Greco-Roman, the Persian, the Indian, and even though the Chinese are not Indo-Aryan, nonetheless, they still have the same steppe nomads with chariots coming down, invading there. Then you get the second generation up and running. Um, as the response partially to these dying behemoths of Egypt that's been there forever and the Sumero babylonian civilization that's been there forever. And this becomes a kind of second phase response to those civilizations. These are now philosophically inclined civilizations, unlike Egypt and Mesopotamia, that, who never discovered philosophy. Right. It's, it's all theology, uh, ritual, symbol, and myth. Now we have the birth of philosophy going across the board in India with the Upanishads and China with the 
hundred schools with Lao Tzu and Confucius, uh, and then in the West with uh, Pythagoras and the pre-Socratics. Now it's a whole new thing. So I'm wondering if perhaps um, we have all these old dying civilizations. China's not going anywhere. Islam's not going anywhere. Uh, India's not going anywhere, and neither is the West. They're all pretty, uh, they all have really tough immune systems. They're all locked into place. And uh, so now I'm wondering what the possibility might be that a new planetary scale civilization might be emerging for the first time, which would then require some sort of myth or narrative that would take the whole planet into account. And I don't know what that would be, but it would be really interesting to see uh, a, a planetary society emerge out of all this. Another very kind Maybe of opti- another very kind of optimistic thought. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's yeah. Michio Kaku's right. type one civilization. Uh, okay, right? okay. No, I don't know. Yeah, yeah well, no, we, I thought we we had spoken about that. Mm-hmm. Um, moving that we would be in a type zero right now, and he identifies like five types. Uh, okay. um, and the type one is is exactly what he's talking about. That we'd have a planetary, a universal like religion, a universal yeah. understanding of things. Um, What's funny because universal because, language. Because political scientists like often talk about like building like a global democracy or something like that, but that's like at the very top of the pyramid, right? You need like you need you need like some kind of global. You need a mythic vision exactly. first. Like, yeah. Then um, we can talk about the political organization. And this and this actually uh, relates to the last question I was going to ask, or or this penultimate question, because um, that's actually a good example of just the balkanization of disciplines and how like people who study politics, they you know. It's like they would analyze something like how do you create, um, you know, like a global democracy and not necessarily appreciate how important like having a mythic substructure is for doing that. Because there's often political science world only ever thinking about politics and maybe like the short term. Um, and what, the, what I was going to ask you is um, if you could just talk a little bit about, uh, you know, why you chose not to. Because I know uh, what I just said relates to some extent to your decision not to pursue academia. I think it's evident to all that you could be like a badass scholar in academia and a great lecturer. Except that I, mean, I would just I'm, end up pissing everyone off, yeah. you know, all my peers, and you know, they, I would be exiled and anathematized and treated like an outsider, exactly like Nietzsche was uh, when he tried academia. It didn't work for him. I know that the same thing would happen to me because I'm such a rogue. What do you think more specifically I, might happen? Like, be a little more specific about like a, a kind of position you might take that would piss people off. Oh, well, I, <laughs> who knows? I just, because I'm so candid about things, you know, I don't like being muzzled with political correctness. That's a classic example right there. Uh, but the whole reason I avoided academe uh, initially had nothing to do with any of that. It had to do with the idea that I knew they would make me specialize. Right. Um, and I was an undergraduate. I finished my BA in English just as I was discovering Joseph Campbell and Oswald Spengler. And um, neither of whom liked the academic world. Spengler didn't even, he got his PhD and left and went and taught high school. Campbell became sort of a, he had an MA, refused to get a PhD and taught. Oh, I didn't at, know that. Yeah, he refused oh. to get a PhD and taught at Sarah Lawrence, uh, which was a women's school at that time uh, for the rest of his life. So again, a kind of outsider strategy. And I thought, well, these guys are probably right. If I go into academe, they're going to make me but specialize, and I don't want to specialize. I want to learn everything. Yeah. I want to learn how the big picture, how everything fits together, how civilization fits together. I want big picture thinking. I want to know a little bit about everything or a lot about everything. So I knew that um, it would be a mistake. And besides, I, I tried. I actually did apply. Um, when I returned from San Francisco, I applied at Arizona State University's Religious Studies Program. Mm-hmm. Uh, to go in there, and I figured, well, if they're going to make me specialize, maybe I'll specialize in Indian spirituality, Hindu, Indian spirituality. There's lots of stuff in there that I'd like to you know, learn Sanskrit, do what they tell me to do. Uh, but I applied, and they, they turned me down. Really? They said on the basis that I was too autonomous. They said, we <laughs> don't think that we can teach you anything. Uh-huh. You're probably too far along. Yeah, they're probably, they're probably published right. two books by that point. Yeah, and they're like, yeah, we. Just <laughs> they knew that it was yeah. going to be a fight. Uh, yeah, I knew it would be a fight. Uh, no, it, it just. So at that point, I was like, "All right, forget it. I'll just be a lone wolf. I'll be a nomad. I'll go around it." And that's what I've done. <laughs> the, the, the Peruvian author Mario Vargas Llosa, I think he once said that like novelists are the only remaining generalists. Do you yeah. agree with that? Yeah, that's a good point. I like yeah. how he put that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I'm a displaced. Uh-huh fiction writer you know I, <laughs> okay. so <laughs> i can relate to that I, uh-huh. I gave up on fiction after college 
La last question on my end. Is sure, cool? go ahead. Um, or no, go ahead. No, and then I'll, I have, yeah. yeah, and then you just took okay. it. I have a, actually, yeah. it just occurred to me, just one small little question. Would you consider, I'm probably using this totally wrong, but would you consider Spangler as, as an archaist? Um, like he's looking back and he's looking at these forms, say like Vivaldi and the music and the, uh, as, as really high points of civilization. But actually during their lifetimes, they suffered like mad. Yeah. You know, it's, it wasn't like they were actually appreciated in their lifetimes. Mm -hmm. They were totally neglected. I mean, Rembrandt ends up being like... Yeah, Rembrandt's a classic uh, case of point. Vivaldi's not much different either. Yeah. You know, he's teaching for, like, young girls and, you know, that are... Yep. Uh, so, how would you... Uh, is he looking back? Is he an archaist then? He's I, definitely yeah, not a futurist. I, I think he is, yeah. Mm -hmm. I think that's a good way to put it. He is okay. an archaist. Um, in a certain sense, living in the past because his, his own, he, he had nothing but scorn for his own time. Yeah. You know, for modernist art, he thought was completely useless. Um, you know, the, the democratic uh, nation state, he thought was the wrong way to go. Um, no, I, he's, he's, I think that's exactly right. He's yeah. an archaist. Yeah. Wait, what was his preferred political form, if not democracy? Well, he, he leaned right. He supported the Nazis initially. Uh -huh. um, he liked their idea of conservation. Uh, and resisting the Anglo world of, you know, the shopping mall mentality. He, he wanted, like, probably agrarian, authoritarian. Yeah, authorita agrarian, authoritarian, that, that kind of thing. Yeah. Then he realized the Nazis, he had the same disillusionment as Heidegger did, that these, these guys are crazy. Yeah. You know, I, mean, I want nothing to do with that. Yeah. Um, so he realized that wasn't going to work. And it's funny because he had an interview with Hitler um, at one point, uh, and uh, he had just completed his last book, The Hour of Decision, uh, and he gave Hitler a copy of it. And, but in that book, he actually wrote, uh, the Nazis are a bunch of racist idiots. <laughs> so he's kind of rolling the dice yeah. there. <laughs> Dude, talk about yeah. balls, man. Yeah. <laughs> he died at 56. I mean, he, he, was, yeah. he was going down early. Yeah, yeah. Was... Um, all right, so uh, last, last question on my end. Um, if you could just talk a little bit about what you're doing now. You said a little bit last night about rock and roll. So yeah, just what, uh, what do you, what are you thinking with the idea about, about r writing a book about rock and roll? Because it's a it's a subject that um, I always wanted to write a book about the semiotics of rock music and rock bands, and I wrote about it a bit in my book Dead Celebrities, Living Icons. I wrote about the Beatles, Elvis Presley, and the Doors, and those were three of the funnest essays I ever wrote. I had a blast going through the herbs of even Elvis Presley, whom I knew nothing about at the time. Uh, I was writing a different book about superheroes. And I thought, well, Elvis Presley is kind of an American superhero. I mean, people worship this guy. Um, let me dig into a biography and see what I think. If it's boring, fine. Um, Which so one did read, you read? This is Peter Guralnik's two-volume biography. So I sit down and read it, and it's like an, an epic novel. And pretty soon I'm just glued to this thing. And I'm like, wow, this is amazing. I never knew all this shit about Elvis. And then I started listening to the music chronologically, bit by bit, you know, the Sun Studios records, uh -huh. um, bit by bit. And I'm starting to, I'm appreciating them. I don't play Elvis, you know, as a result of this or anything, but I did appreciate the music and learning about it and what he did, what the semiotics were. And then pretty soon after I finished the biography, I was like, I'm on fire with this. Here's a whole chapter. And then that became the seed for a brand new book, Dead Celebrities, Living Icons. I was like, I'll take a look at James Dean next and Marilyn Monroe and, and eventually JFK and The Doors and Walt Disney and Howard Hughes. So that was probably the funnest book I ever wrote. Okay, wait, and, let's uh, do this really quickly. Three favorite Elvis songs, Beatles songs, and Doors songs. Let's compare notes. Okay. Um, well, I like all the stuff that he did for Sun Studios. That's uh -huh. my favorite. That's like the, is that the earliest? Like yeah, kind that's of like, like 54, his, 55, yep. 50s? Uh -huh. It's like six or seven songs. Uh -huh. um, those are my favorite right there, that Sun uh -huh. Studios, because it's, it's very raw. Like Heartbreak Hotel is like so big. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know if that's Sun Studios. He's starting to shift yeah. to R RCA with that, I think. Oh, okay, Heartbreak gotcha. Heartbreak Hotel. But um, yeah. Those are great. Uh -huh, and okay. uh, well, The Doors? Um, God, there's so many. I love The Doors. Do you have a favorite album? Uh, the first. The first? Yeah, yeah that's probably first. my favorite, yeah. too. That's probably my yeah. favorite. It seems like they hit the, you know, they, they hit the ground running, and then it sort of gradually gets diluted. Well, I mean, Maybe the, Morrison's alcoholism had something to do well, with it. The middle ones are terrible, and then, they, and then they resurge the, yeah, at the end. At, at Morrison the end. Hotel yep. and uh, L.A. Woman. Those, exactly. those last two albums are L.A. Awesome. Woman may be my favorite. Yeah, my the, favorite Doors song of all time. Uh, that yeah, and actually, um, I mean, obviously, Jim Morrison is the fiery core of the Doors, but Robbie Krieger thinks that "L.A. Woman" is like the quintessential Doors song. I really like. I, I it think too. so too. Yeah, actually, my tennis uh, coach. Writers on the Storm, also, you know, but 
That, I, I <laughs> love two. I love that song. Every time those appear on the radio, I get goosebumps. Dude, Rider, yeah, is, Riders on the Storm is unbelievable. Yeah, yeah, he really created an atmosphere there. It's, it's totally unique. Yeah. Just a keyboard going and the stormy references and yeah, those are just gems. Um, yeah, favorite Beatles song. Uh, Beatles. Well, my we know, favorite we know Beatles your, albums we know your favorite are Beatle is John Lennon. Yeah, my favorite <laughs> Beatles albums are Revolver and Rubber Soul. Right there, yeah. it's like the, the apogee of the yeah. Beatles. They figured out their game. They got it. Uh, whereas as you're getting to the White Album, yeah, there's a lot of good stuff on the White Album, but it's starting to fall apart. Which there. of the two do you of the Rubber Soul and Revolver? Uh, rubber Soul. Oh, right. See, I, I, would, I would prefer that Revolver. to Revolver. But they're oh, both actually. almost equally as good. So. But Rubber Soul is very clearly before Revolver. Um, yeah. Right. I mean, it's because, it's like, um, I sort of think, like, the perfect moment in American culture was, like, right then, like, 64, 65. Yeah. Because yep. it was a nice yep. fusion. It was, like, before the 60s. Chaos and... Yeah, it was before. It was like it was like maybe just just before the springtime of the '60s. It was kind of mm-hmm. when, when like the West was still kind of combining the old '50s with like the new kind of psychedelic. Right. There was this nice fusion moment, and, yeah, and yeah, to yeah. me, Rubber Soul and Revolver. That's uh-huh. like yeah. that's what makes them so awesome. Um, yeah, I, I lo- like I'm I'm with you on those two, particularly Revolver. I mean, like Eleanor I think she's... Rigby, maybe my favorite Beatles song of all time. Mm, interesting. Yeah. yeah. I wouldn't put that at my time. From Revolver, I think my favorite is She Said, She Said. That's a uh, great song. I love yeah. that song. Uh-huh. I've probably listened to it like 500 times. Oh, it's awesome. Yeah. I didn't love the Beatles before I investigated them. But then again, it was the case once I investigated them, then I became a permanent fan. You know, just uh, now I see why they're so great. You know, I had to sit down with it, though, album yeah. by album, song by song, evolutionarily, and yeah. follow the track. Cool. But anyway, so, so so you're considering uh, writing. Yeah, I'm a book considering on... writing a, a book about uh, rock and roll. Um, mm-hmm. So that's one project. But I've got a bunch of other stuff floating around. Care know. to mention one or two? About a book those? about the art of Mary Church. That's one. I have a poetry collection that I'm finishing. Uh, and then there's that troubled hypermodernity sequel. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure what the fate of that book is going to be. But the fact of the matter is, um, three quarter of it is done. So. If we just walk away from it, we're leaving a perfectly good but manuscript. Can you, can you three tell, quarters of it is done. Can you distill that story? Because I'm a little out of it. When you say it's troubled, I don't even really know what you're talking about. Oh, oh, is this like this the, is the personal? Be, is this like the personal stuff? Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, we just got into it like a band. You know, we yeah. just got into a dispute between uh, Brian Francis Culkin and Michael Aaron Kamins and I. Uh, kind of a well, there's a lot of ego, you know, power issues, control over the book. Oh, I see. Uh, you know, who wants to be in it? And <laughs> it's just been a power struggle. Is, so. is there a substantive disagreement at the heart of it that's interesting? Or? Um, no. The main thing is the rivalry between uh, Michael Kamins and Brian Culkin. Uh, and Brian does not. I always wanted the second book to be a trialogue between all three of us mm-hmm. equally. Each of us sitting down uh, with our Skype discussions and have all three of us uh, have something to say. Because after all... Michael Aaron Kamins and I were the creators of hypermodernity, not the word, but the concept of it. We fleshed out the concept years before Brian showed up. And then Brian showed up while Michael was busy working on a book about Jordan Peterson. He got a publishing contract with a British publisher who wanted him to write a sensationalistic book about Jordan Peterson. And once he realized that was the case, he, was, he dropped Back it. Back out, uh-huh. uh, But by that point, Brian and I are halfway through the first hypermodernity book, so... He wasn't going to be in it, uh, and I said, well, at least let him write the preface. So we had him in there writing the preface. Uh, but my idea for the second book disagreed with Brian's idea. My idea was that the book should be a, an equal trilogue with all three of us. Mm-hmm. And Brian was like, no, I don't think that should be the case. I think we've got a formula, uh, the two of us doing it, with Michael doing a preface. And if we don't follow that formula, uh, it's going to mess it up. Uh, and okay. I, we just had a disagreement about it. But we did do, Brian and I did do three full-scale conversations, but we got to that troubled fourth conversation that we can't seem to figure out where um, Brian's like, okay, let's bring Michael in as a trilogue and let's do it. And we did it, uh, and no one was happy with it. It was just a conversation about our group, you know, the three of us plus Mary Church plus the UK digital artist Chris Boyd uh, and the uh, Chinese-American Ikkyu Sojin. We were just talking about all of that group um, but Michael didn't like it, Brian didn't like it, I didn't like it. So <laughs> okay. we were like, this didn't work. We tried it, it didn't work, 
And then it got into a huge fight. And we're like, what do we do then? If we're not going to do a trial log about the group, uh, what do we do? Then we should have a conversation about hypermodernity. But Michael's like, well, that should just be you and I in that conversation. Since we originated the concept, chapter four should just be you and I discussing the essence of hypermodernity as we initially visualized it without Brian. And Brian's like, no, 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 you can't disinclude me because I've been in every one of these chapters all along. You know, so it's, it's like a rock yeah. band. Yeah, you man. <laughs> it's, it's, you know, egos. Okay, this is an annoying question, but can you give like a one or two sentence distillation of what hypermodernity is? Yeah, hypermodernity uh, is the sequel to postmodernity, uh -huh. which comes in with the internet. And the, um, you know you're in a new age when you start seeing the rotting shells of the infrastructure of a previous age dotting the landscape. And I noticed a lot of shop empty shopping malls everywhere. You know, Tower Records closes, uh, all these magazines disappear, newspapers, magazines disappear. We get all this digital media replacing all this wonderful analog media that I grew up with and these rotting shopping malls. That's when you know you're in a different age. It's not post-modernity anymore. Uh, so I decided hypermodernity is a word that works best. Uh, it pre-existed Michael and I. Um, but when I sat down to do an internet search on, I was like, what is hypermodernity? Oh, let's take a look. Nothing. There's nothing. Nobody can give a coherent, there's nothing. A few sentences here, a few sentences there. I'm like, okay, well, maybe I better write a blog essay and define it, which, which is what I did. And that became the seed for the book. And uh, yeah, it's the digitization of everything. Mm -hmm. It's hyper, in the term hypermodernity, as opposed to, let's say, metamodernity or ultramodernity, or the worst of all was, uh, I think it was Alan Kirby's book, Digimodernity. <laughs> Digimodernity yeah, does not, not roll quite, off Not quite the a tongue. ring to it. No, yeah. no. Hypermodernity is easy to remember. It rolls right off the tongue. You get it immediately. Hyper. Everything's hyper now. Hyper. It's like a, a culture that's gone into a hyperthyroid metabolism. You know, everything is too much is not enough. And that's hype. Hype, hyper, over. Uh, Uber, uh, all these, Michael pulled the etymology, the etymology of the word apart mm -hmm. and showed all these other words that are related to the word hype and hyper. They all mean over. The German word Uber is related to it. They all mean over, above, excess. Mm -hmm. So it works. Yeah. And it seems to be working because the culture seems to be picking up using the word it. and using it now. Everywhere I go, people are saying, oh, in, yeah, in hypermodernity, we're doing this. So <laughs> I think we've pulled off something here. Getting it's, people to use words is not, <laughs> it's not easy. I was going to say, doing it without forcing them to use words, yeah, yeah, that's, that's the way you're supposed to do it, and it's not easy. They're like, yeah, right. yeah, yeah, this is hypermodernity. Yeah. You're, you're exactly right. So Cool. Anyway. So, yeah, and actually, this is your favorite epic. Yes, that's right. Here we go. Yep. All right. Thank you so much. This has been awesome, guys. Uh, I loved every second of this. What yeah. a great conversation. One of my all-time yeah. favorites. Oh, yeah. man. Yeah, so absolutely. One of my oh, all-time favorites. Good. Fantastic. Likewise. Definitely, yeah. one of, definitely one of ours. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>